Hey guys, hope everybody's doing well. Uh, we will go ahead and get started in a few minutes. If you have not seen, Lindsay was nice enough to uh, put some slides together for y'all for some pathology stuff. So y'all should go download those. She's gonna cover the path. Um, I'm gonna go through the micro and the uh, farm stuff. Um, and then it, right when we get started, we're gonna just talk about heart failure real, real fast because um, I think that's uh, a good starting point for, for this stuff. And as always, um, if y'all have any questions, just speak up. Uh, this is informal. Uh, we have an exam Tuesday, so we're gonna try to keep this uh, fairly quick. All right, Lindsay, anything? No. Nope. <laughs> All right. I mean, I have, I have a tidbit at the beginning of the slides, but you can do your tidbit first. Okie dokie. Um, all right, so y'all definitely know by now, go to our pages. The link for the YouTube um, playlist is here. Knowing like. Um, and just so you guys know, uh, you know, we did this rebranding thing. Um, the, the school emailed Lindsay and I and said that if we were not gonna do formal PLGs, we were no longer allowed to use the DES in our name. That was the single and only reason uh, we rebranded and took the DES off. So um, uh, don't believe everything you heard or have read. This is not some scheme to start making money out of you guys. All right, so the school asked us to, so we took it off. Now, if you click the link here, uh, it'll bring you to the page. This is what we've got so far for term four, but just bookmark this because technically the, uh, the channel's private. All right, and again, this is not affiliated with school in any way, but if you do not follow IEA on Instagram, uh, you should, we're offering tutoring now and we do the facts of the day too. So you should do that. Now, let's talk about heart failure. So. The first thing, um, first thing I want to talk about is, well, so you don't go directly into heart failure, right? So you first get systolic or diastolic dysfunction, right? So this dysfunction will eventually lead to heart failure. But we want to talk about this process, right? Because by the time the patients come in, a 65-year-old male, they come in and their hearts, they've been through systolic, diastolic dysfunction. Um, and, you know, what was this process over the past 20 years that exactly happened? Um, as we know, the body has this amazing way of compensating for all of these uh, pathological deficits we develop, right? So that's why by the time your patient comes in and they're, uh, you know, they're, um, they have, uh, they're symptomatic, you know, their, their heart functions down to, you know, their ejection fractions down to 20% or their renal perfusion or their GFR is down to 20%. That's just because the body has great ways of compensating, but it means by the time you get symptomatic, you're usually in um, the later stage of the disease. So we want to define systolic dysfunction and diastolic dysfunction before we begin become symptomatic. By the time you get by the time you become symptomatic, then technically you're in heart failure. So what's the process, right? So typically, um, typically what happens is we're going to go into systolic failure first. Okay. Um, not sorry, the systolic dysfunction first, not failure. So what does that mean? What does syst systole mean? That is ejection, right? This is your pump, right? That is when the ventricle squeezes and all the, the, the blood goes out of the ventricle, right? So this is by definition pump failure. Can you properly get blood into the ventricle? Yeah, you're good at that point. But the systolic dysfunction is a problem with the pump, okay? So what typically happens that's gonna cause this? Well, at least in the US, MIs, right? If you have some sort of myocardial infarction, if you have a heart attack, some of that tissue is gonna die, right? And by definition, if the tissue that is acting as the pump dies, you're gonna go into systolic dysfunction, eventually maybe even systolic heart failure. So when you hear systolic dysfunction, I want you to think of pump failure. Now, what are some other causes that can uh, lead to this systolic dysfunction? Well, what if we had longstanding hypertension or even let's use aortic stenosis, okay? Um, 
would just make a caveat real quick. I just want to point this out. Here's a trick I always use. If they ever give you a patient that's like 70 plus years old, I always think aortic stenosis first. Okay. And that's just because age related calcification of that, that aortic valve is like super prominent. So if you ever see a 70 plus year old patient in a question, um, think aortic stenosis. Okay. Now let's get back to it. Right. So now what are we talking about with hypertension and aortic stenosis? Aortic stenosis? We're talking at a very much elevated afterload, right? So hypertension, the pump has to squeeze against all of that systemic vasoconstriction, right? You're, you're blowing uh, through a very narrow straw, right? Aortic stenosis is a stenotic valve. Again, you're trying to pump through a very narrow opening. So again, the, the, the pump is going to start to fail, right? If either, either you have some sort of uh, MI that causes the myocardial damage, so the pump's not strong enough, or you're just having to work so hard that the uh, against this high afterload that eventually it's going to it's going to have dysfunction and lead to failure. Now, so what happens at this point? At this point, we're going to have a backlog of blood into the ventricle. Okay, so that means we're going to have an increased in diastolic volume. Okay, so what am I saying? I'm saying that the pump has begun to fail. You're squeezing so much that, um, and it's failing. So that blood that is supposed to go out of the ventricle is staying in the ventricle, okay? So sometimes they say this pump failure is like, um, is like, like the walls are floppy, right? So if you have a myocardial infarction and the, the, some of the wall is dead, it gets floppy. But the point is that you can't properly squeeze all of the blood out of the ventricle. So you're gonna get in, increased, uh, blood left over uh, left over after systole after that pump ejection right so by definition this is going to just congest that ventricle and you're going to get an increase in diastolic volume okay so now we have our precursor to what's going on now there's nothing in medicine is black and white there are grays to everything some patients particularly renal patients that have volume overload, they can go into diastolic dysfunction first. But this is classic, especially in the United States. You're gonna go into systolic uh, dysfunction first, typically MI or some sort of longstanding hypertension. Okay, so now what we see is, and this is pretty classic for everyone. At this point, this systolic dysfunction, you're kind of living with it. You're like five, 10 years into your hypertension, like you're fine. But at some point, this in diastolic volume is going to be a problem. Okay, so what you're going to actually end up doing is you're going to try to hypertrophy the ventricle. Why are you doing that? You're trying to make the pump strong again, right? That's your goal. Now, the body's not thinking the long-term consequences of, of hypertrophying the ventricle. It's saying this pump isn't pumping a lot of blood. We're going to try to hypertrophy the ventricle. We need to make the ventricle thicker so the pump works better. Okay, right, so you're starting to do this, but then what happens, right? Then this ventricle hypertrophied, strong and muscular, it ends up getting stiff, okay? Just because it's a lot of muscle there. So then at this point, you're in trouble because now you're going to go into di uh, diastolic uh, dysfunction. And what, what do we use synonymously for dias, dias, diastole, like where systole was pump failure? This is a filling failure. Okay, so I hope this makes sense to you guys. We went through this process, right? So now we had, we hypertrophied the ventricle, the ventricle becomes stiff. Now, if you have a stiff ventricle, it's not compliant anymore, right? It's not gonna, when you wanna put blood in it, it's not gonna get bigger, right? So you are going to now be in diastolic dysfunction, a filling problem, okay? So maybe you're able to, this. You, maybe you were able to compensate a little bit with that hypertrophy uh, by making the pump stronger, but now because you, you hypertrophied it, you made it stiff, it's not compliant, meaning it's not gonna stretch. So now you have a problem filling the ventricle. 
Okay. So this is the process. Now, in real life, there's no, it's not like this linear thing where you go into systolic dysfunction, then go into diastolic dysfunction, then systolic failure, diastolic failure. It kind of happens synonymously. But we know what our primary cause was, right? Our primary cause was this, well, it was it had MI or hypertension or whatever led to the systolic or pump problem. But you could see the process by the time this 65 year old patient comes in with problems breathing and you know chest pain on exertion, you're already at this point where you're having trouble filling, okay? So th this is the whole process of how this works. So make sure you keep in mind these ideas of systole is a pump, systolic is a pump failure, whereas diastolic is going to be a filling failure. Now, there's just one more thing I wanted to add, and that is this ejection fraction thing. Because on the surface, if you said something had a preserved ejection fraction, you say, okay, that sounds good, right? Okay, maybe not. So when we talk about systolic, uh, this, let's say failure, right? So we have a problem with our pump. Can we get uh, adequate blood out of the ventricle? Well, no, because the pump's not working right. So in systolic failure, you're going to get a decreased ejection fraction, right? Ejection fraction is the fraction of blood that's in that gets out of the ventricle compared to what was in there before. You're in diastolic, uh, um, um, in diastolic volume. So this is the same thing as saying um, uh, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Now, why is it reduced? Because the amount of blood in the pump is not working. The pump is not working, it's systolic failure. So when the pump squeezes, it doesn't squeeze as well. So that amount of blood uh, is gonna, you're gonna have a decreased ejection fraction, decreased amount of blood there. Um, it is coming out, that should have, okay? So the pump is not squeezing hard enough because it's floppy, there's dead tissue, um, then you're gonna get a decreased ejection fraction. So when we talk about the pharmacology behind it, there are certain drugs such as digoxin, which they don't really use anymore, but it's a very classic example. You can make the pump work a little bit better, okay? They love to test on it. So if, if it makes the pump, it's an inotrope. So if it makes the pump uh, work stronger, um, you can help to rectify this, this ejection fraction problem. Now let's look at diastolic. All right, so now we have a filling problem. Now, if I told you you had a heart failure, but a preserved ejection fraction, You'd be like, well, okay. I mean, then I'm getting the right amount of blood out, right? No, that's not what's happening. The problem is that the heart is filling with less blood. Okay. So let's just use, I'll use arbitrary numbers here. Um, let's say you originally had 10 liters in your, I know you don't, but if, if you had 10 liters in your heart and you were able to eject, five liters, five liters of that, all right? That's a rejection fraction of 55%, okay? Which is about, these. the liters aren't correct, but your ejection fraction is around 55%. That's what it should be, okay? Now, if we had a diastolic failure, let's say the heart was only able to fill with eight liters, right? And of that eight liters, you got four liters out. You were able to eject four liters, okay? Uh, uh, well, sorry, this would have been 50%, right? 50%, right, right, 10 of five, you get it. Um, so if, let's go back, if you had originally, before you had heart failure, you ejected, you had 10 liters in your heart and you ejected five, you'd have an ejection fraction of 50%, okay? Now you're in diastolic failure, your heart can only fill with eight liters instead of the original uh, 10 liters. And you're able to eject four liters of that. Well, your ejection fraction is still 50%, right? So that doesn't mean, it, that's not good. Like you're, there's still less overall blood. You'd have to look at the actual cardiac output to figure it out. So just understand that that preserved ejection fraction doesn't necessarily mean like you're getting out the amount of blood you should. It just means from the amount of blood that was in the ventricle coming out, it, it, you're still getting uh, you know, the, the same um, percentages out of it. Okay, so just keep that in mind. If you have a pump failure here, you're gonna have a reduced ejection fraction because the pump's not working. If you have a diastolic failure here, you'll get a preserved ejection fraction, but that's only because you had a problem filling. You weren't able to fill it up properly. 
Okay, so those are some of the tricky things. If you get those straight, um, some of those higher third or fourth order questions, um, you'll be okay with. All right, where am I at here? Um, okay, um, okay. Do y'all have any questions? I'm gonna let Lindsay take over. She's, she's got the slides for the pathology stuff. Do y'all have any questions about that? Because that's kind of the basis of like understanding and not just regurgitating answers. Like, um, okay. Um, all right, Lindsay, it's all yours. Cool. Hey guys, so we're gonna go over, come on, the path. So this is tips on approaching are approaching all types of questions on these exams. Um, FTCM was kind of like FTM in that it was different in how you studied. I felt that from CRS on, you could kind of think about the questions in the same way and you would be successful. So for both PATH and micro, make sure that you are identifying the clinical presentation because that's what's gonna be in the vignette. So it'll describe the patient and then ask you something about the pathology for the pathology. They love risk factors and complications. So for example, atherosclerosis is a big risk factor for a lot of cardiac diseases. And then if there's a complication down the line, they love risk factors and complications. And sometimes those are very small tidbits on the slide and it's not touched on greatly. It's like a small text, um, just, but make sure that if you're seeing that, that you are highlighting it and noting it because it's very high yield. Um, if there's a gene that's associated with something that's also high yield, um, at risk for something down the line. And then micro, again, they're going to describe it. And they love asking about the characteristics of the causative agent or what outright what is the causative agent. So we'll go over that. But, you know, sometimes it's as small of a detail as, you know, gram pox gram positive diplococci or you know single stranded positive sense rna like down to that kind of detail so just be aware of that and then histo slides are your friend in year two the reason being um in year one it was really tedious because histo was all about identification and what are you looking at for year two, when you're talking about pathology, histo is actually your friend and it's actually going to be one of those buzz things to clue you in on what you're looking at. So when you see histo, don't fret, actually um, rejoice because that can be an easy trigger, an easy buzzword for a um, pathology. Then farm mechanism of action, ADRs. If something has a very specific one, then they're probably going to test it. Um, but at this point, work backwards. What I did is, because they have those summary slides where they say, this is how you treat hypertension. This is how you treat heart failure. Work from those slides and go backwards and say, okay, this is first line. This is second line. This is what you give. And then look at mechanism of action and ADR. Because at this point, hopefully you've all gone through everything. So I'm um, just make sure that you know the formula of how to treat somebody with a certain pathology. Okay, so we're going to cover high yield points for each. I condensed this greatly. I went through the slides and I picked out the things that I think you need to focus on at this point in your studying. Um, we'll talk about the path, pathology, the pathogenesis and everything, but I, um, I made a point to pull out the big high yield buzzwords for all of the pathologies that we're going through and then the histo as well. So CVS, atherosclerosis. So um, don't get this confused with arteriosclerosis. Um, we're going to talk about arteriosclerosis in a sec, but atherosclerosis, this is associated with hyperlipidemia. So this is the um, where you get the plaque. So you, risk factors, they love modifiable versus non-modifiable. -modif so things you can and can't control. Smoking is a big, 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 big one they like to focus in on. Some other ones are, you know, if it's associated with um, uh, atherosclerosis, you're going to have increased lipids, that's hyperlipidemia, and then hypertension and um, diabetes, of course, and then non-modifiable um, age male, family history, genetics. Yes, unfortunately, there are ethnicities and genders that are going to be predisposed to some um, 
uh, pathologies. So this leads to a lot of bad stuff. Atherosclerosis is the, at the heart of a lot of coronary pathology. So just understand that. Um, so it can affect essentially any elastic artery. Um, so coronary, cerebral, peripheral, vascular, and um, leads to a lot of bad stuff. So essentially it gets weak. If you have something else that's depositing on your vessel, the vessel is going to be weak and things are going to happen. So it's going to be susceptible to rupture. And we're going to talk about aneurysms in a bit. Um, it can also lead to an obstruction flow. So MI and angina, MI would be like a complete obstruction where you're getting ischemia and tissue death versus angina, which is just ischemia and then it's reversible. Um, but pathogenesis, um, you can get some endothelial injury, hint, hint, smoking, that's direct endothelial injury. And then once you get that endothelial injury, you know, your inflammatory process, you have increased vascular permeability, which lets a lot of stuff in, including leukocytes. Um, you have accumulation of oxidized, that's to say LDL, I apologize for that, in the vessel. Monocytes arrive, um, transform to macrophages, and you get foam cells, platelets that adhere and activate, releasing factors. Um, something big that they like to touch on, small muscle cell recruitment and proliferation, and then um, that's supposed to say ECM. <laughs> Apparently my fingers are dyslexic. I'm sorry guys. Um, but smooth muscle cell recruitment and then ECM production, T cell recruitment. Um, and then abdominal aorta is the biggest one. So yes, do know the occurrence. So atherosclerosis, atherosclerosis is most common in the abdominal aorta. Second would be the iliac artery followed by coronary popliteal ICA, um, internal carotid, and then circle of Willis. So um, this is important to note, you have a vulnerable and a stable plaque. Notice that the vulnerable plaque has a very thin cap and a thick core. That cap can be very easily ruptured and you get a lot of bad stuff if that ruptures. You can get a thrombosis, which is happens after the plaque and that thrombosis can get lodged essentially anywhere. Um, but uh, thrombosis is very, um, uh, it, increased risk of heart attack. So complete occlusion there. And then stable plaque um, is the thick cap and thin core. So do know what makes it vulnerable versus what makes a plaque stable. Clinical consequences, um, plaque rupture, that gives you a, um, you can get hematoma there, blood leaking, erosion and thrombosis. Remember thrombosis can um, result in occlusion and then fibrocalcific plaque plaque, which is stenosis. And then if you have something that is stenosis, then you are not going to have good compliance and compliance is important to adjust to um, different changes. So that is not good. So some clinical consequences, again, this is really important. If something is a con um, has a consequence down the road, you need to take note of this. This is more of an umbrella of consequences because atherosclerosis it's such a widespread thing, um, but just understand coronary heart disease. We're going to talk about that. Um, a vascular disease, so stroke, so um, thrombosis can go and they can cause ischemic strokes because it can lodge in any of the arteries in the brain. That's how you get um, stroke ischemic stroke. And then abdominal aortic, a, aortic aneurysm, those are um, quickly fatal. And then peripheral vascular disease. Okay, so hypertension, you have benign versus malignant. Um, benign, you um, know the histologic characterizations. This doesn't just happen in one place, this is everywhere. So when we go over renal path, we're gonna talk about the effects of um, this there too, because it's gonna be the same thing. So benign, you get hyalinization of the vessel wall because this is chronic stress over time. So the vessel essentially has the ability to adjust to what's going on. So you have um, hemodynamic stress, continual hemodynamic stress, you get deposition of the hyaline that leads to the um, luminal narrowing and then impaired blood supply, which can give you ischemia. And then malignant, malignant hypertension is a sudden increase in blood pressure. Um, and that what makes it malignant is end organ damage. So in response to the sudden increase, you're going to get duplication of the basement membrane, mem 
basement membrane, and then um, very, very, very important, smooth muscle cell hyperplasia. Please um, highlight that. That is um, a very big factor of uh, this pathogenesis and what makes it bad. So like I said, histo is your friend here. You can clearly see the difference between the hyalinized um, vessel versus the onion skin appearance because you get that. Um, you get essentially the duplication of the basement membrane. So it just kind of goes on top of each other. So you can see the layers, you can see the concentric layers. And then that's what's gonna clue you in on, okay, this is malignant hypertension. And then this is associated with fibronoid necrosis. So um, necrotizing arteriolitis, you'll remember fibronoid necrosis from FTCM. Aneurysms, this is just a dilatation in the wall. Um, remember something that can lead to this is going to be the atherosclerosis. Why? Because it makes the walls very weak. So you can get that dil um, dilation of the wall. True, all layers involved, false. It's just a wall defect and it can lead to an extra vascular hematoma. At the top, I put the different kinds. So true saccular, um, fusiform, and then a false aneurysm, which is just the um, hematoma in the extra vascular tissue. Some etiologies, of course, atherosclerosis, we already talked about that, syphilitic and mycotic, we're going to reference those later. And then um, vasculitis, so polyarteritis, nodosis, and Kawasaki, then Marfan's, um, there's supposed to be a comma there, Marfan's, comma, berry. Um, Marfan syndrome, of course, it's connected to shoe disease and you um, will get weakening. And then berry aneurysms are associated with a bunch of different things, but um, berry aneurysms are very bad because they can lead to a subarachnoid hemorrhage if they are um, ruptured. The big thing here, remember this cystic medial degeneration. So you have alteration of the structural integrity, again, from the smooth muscle cell and extracellular matrix alterations. That's very important. Um, the most common cause of AAA, which is um, abdominal aortic aneurysm, that's atherosclerosis. And that's different from the ascending aorta. Um, but why? Because the plaque is going to increase diffusion distance. So you're going to get ischemia of the inner media. I have the picture down at the very bottom. So what is the basis of this? Large vessels need nutrition too. So you have the vasovasorum, which are little vessels. Um, arteries that are running in the wall of the vessel and they're providing nutrition for that area. So if you have an atherosclerotic plaque, you are increasing that diffusion distance. So if you increase that distance, then you're not going to get enough nutrition to that inner um, media. Whereas most common cause of ascending aorta aneurysm is hypertension. Why? Because hypertension, is, you're going to have narrowing of the base of vasorum and then you have ischemia of the outer media, and then of course, loss of smooth muscle cells and aortic degeneration. So just understand that the basic asorum is very important in the pathogenesis of the aneurysms. Um, why, you know, AAA is going to be the atherosclerosis and the diffusion barrier, and then the ascending aorta, it's going to be the narrowing of the basic asorum due to the hypertension and the stress. Okay, continued. Um, so we said that atherosclerosis is um, going to give you the AAA. What is the biggest risk factor? Smoking, which makes sense because when we went back and we talked about the atherosclerosis, the biggest risk factor was smoking. Why is it smoking? Because smoking is going to give you endothelial injury. It's going to have an insult on there. And then you get this process that um, eventually leads to an atherosclerotic plaque. But um, you need to understand that um, people get that confused all the time, how the triple A, so abdominal aneurysm is due to smoking. So smoking leads to atherosclerosis, leads to weakening, and you get the triple A um, versus the ascending that it's going to be hypertension can be asymptomatic, but you can also see it in a pulsating mass. If you have a ruptured abdominal aneurysm, um, not good. <laughs> so a patient's gonna present, I didn't put this on the slide, I don't know why, but a patient's gonna present with chest pain that radiates to their back. That's the biggest um, pertinent positive symptom that you can have. You can have the pulsating abdominal mass. That's more if it's not ruptured, but it's the severe, it's called, they, it's described as a ripping chest pain that radiates to the back. That's how you know, that's what can clue you in on AAA. 
Um, you can also have a mycotic aneurysm um, that is commonly due to salmonella. So just make that note there. And then syphilitic aneurysm, this is due to tertiary syphilis. I put the picture on here, the tree bark appearance. Um, this is the hallmark of the syphilitic aneurysm. And it's due to obliterative endartitis of the vasovasorum, which leads to the medial destruction and weakening. Again, we talked about how vasovasorum is very important in the pathogenesis of um, aneurysm. So here, when we're talking about the syphilitic aneurysm, you're getting obliterative, endar obliterative endartitis of the vasovasorum. Um, but it is that tree, tree bark appearance. Um, I put that picture there. You can look up a couple more pictures if you want to know what that looks Looks like, um, but if you see if you see something called tree bark appearance or something, you're talking about it, and it's a blitter of endartitis. Again, Marfan, fibrillin, and then berry. Um, berry is associated with um, autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, um, and then the rupture causes subarachnoid hemorrhage. Aortic dissection. So this is blood separating in the laminar planes of the media. So it creates a blood filled channel in the wall. Why is this bad? Because, well, it's not in the lumen, so it's not gonna go to the systemic tissues. And so um, you're basically getting this big hematoma. Um, Middle-aged men risk hypertension. Um, kids are more at risk if they have a syndromic disease, so Marfan's Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, so connective, connective tissue. Um, so if you get it young, it's probably because there is some kind of defect. If you get it older, it's because you have continued stress on the area that's weakening it over time, so hypertension. Most common cause of death is gonna be rupture and bleeding into the pericardium, the pleural space, the peritoneal cavities. So your blood volume just immediately crashes and you go into hypovolemic, all kinds of shock, but hypovolemic shock. And then you can get retrograde dissection to the aortic, to the aortic root. So instead of going down, it's going to go back up near the heart, which can disrupt the, um, the valve annulus at the heart. Um, you can get cardiac tamponade, aortic insufficiency, um, if it, it, it can extend to the great, um, great arteries of the neck and into other arteries. So if you get, a, it, if it extends into the coronary arteries, you're going to get an MI because the coronary arteries um, supply nutrients to the heart. And if you can't get that, you're going to get ischemia and then tissue damage. And then spinal arteries, if it gets into, if it goes there, it, you get transverse myelitis. Oh, and at the top right, that's just the clinical presentation. So if you're looking at the vignette, that's what you're going to see. Continued, um, the big thing histologically, you're going to see cystic medial de degeneration and then um, just a smooth muscle cell dropout necrosis, elastic tissue fragmentation and accumulation of um, the amorphous proteoglycan rich ECM. Vasculitides, um, this took me a little bit to get down, but there are a few things in each that are gonna clue you in to, this is it. So this is just inflammation of vessels, that simple as that. Um, if you want an overarching definition, the umbrella term. So vasculitides, just um, inflammation. So you have different ones affecting the large vessels, the medial, the medium vessels, and then the small vessels, and they're going to have different presentations of each. So starting with the large vessel, you have giant cell arteritis, a really common one or not common, but common that you hear about is going to be temporal arteritis. So you're going to come in with like this really bad headache, jaw claudication, ocular symptoms, like this really terrible, headache, temporal pain. Um, so you have to do a biopsy of the temporal artery to um, know what it is. The big thing here, it can lead to blindness. It can lead to permanent blindness if you don't catch it and treat it early. So prepon uh, preponderance is um, over 50 females more than males. Sorry, woman. And then this is gonna be T cell mediated. And then this is associated with polymyalgia's rheumatica. Large vessel 
Um, again, tak Takayasu arteritis. So this is gonna be a pulseless disease. So the patient is going to come in with weaker absent pulses in the limb. So that if you have a vignette that says that, that clues you in on, okay, this is Takayasu arteritis. Um, you can also fever, night sweats, arthritis, myalgia, skin nodules, which the, all this makes sense because you're getting inflammation of the arteries. And so downstream, you're getting all of these sim um, symptoms. So aortic arch, great vessels, renal artery, vertebral, um, young girls, and then you have granulomatous thickening, thickening and narrowing of the aortic arch. So if you hear that description where you see this image, that's what you are talking about here. Then median vessel, um, crap, I forgot what that stood for. <laughs> Sorry, guys. So young adult um, patient is going to pre present with just general fe um, symptoms of fever, sweats, weight loss. I know that's very nonspecific, um, but something that is very indicative is going to be following HPV infections, hepatitis B. The big, 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 big thing that you guys need to highlight and remember is the lungs are spared in this disease. So polyarteritis and dosis, there we go. Lungs. Um, lungs are spared. That is a huge thing about this disease because a lot of things are affected, but not the lungs. So highlight that, star it, remember it for your exam. Then your histo, you're gonna see transmural inflammation and then the fibrinoid necrosis. Kawasaki disease, um, this is endemic in Japan and it's gonna be kids. So you in the vignette, you're probably gonna see something along the lines of a young kid from Japan. It's gonna come in with fever. They um, typically have cervical lymphadenopathy. You'll have conjunctival erythema. So the eyes are gonna be red, strawberry tongue. That's a big one there because that's um, very specific to this. And then hand, feet, edema, erythema and rash. So big, 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 there is a risk for aneurysm, rupture, hemorrhage, and MI, and this is a delayed hypersensitivity reaction, and the autoantibodies are to the endothelial cells and the um, smooth muscle cells. Burgers disease, um, I remember they did the, one of these in the, one of the clinical skills small groups. So um, young male, extensive tobacco history. Tobacco is the biggest, biggest, biggest thing here. So it's, um, I think they call it like hypersensitivity to tobacco or something along those lines, but tobacco is the biggest main risk factor here. So they're gonna come in with cl um, classic Raynaud's. So the fingers turn white when it gets cold and then um, pain in foot. So that's another claudication, um, pain in foot when you walk. And then, um, so what leads to, so over the progression, you get thrombangitis obliterans. So what happens is you get ischemia and infarction of the digits and then ulceration and um, gangrene of the distal digits. Wegener's um, for all of these small vessel um, arteritis, vasculitides. Um, know what it's mediated. So Wegener's at C Inca, um, PR3 Inca mediated. Um, here you are going to see symptoms of upper respiratory infection, lower respiratory infection, and you're going to see renal involvement. So any combination of any of these, um, I remember perforated nasal septum, that was a weird one, but it stuck out to me and I feel like I saw that on the exam, but um, just know that it has upper respiratory, so sinuses and everything, but lower respiratory lungs and then renal involvement. So you're gonna see characteristics from all three of these sites. Um, so the actual disease, you're gonna have a triad of focal necrotizing vasculitis, necrotizing granulomas, and necrotizing glomerulonephritis. So this is very rapidly fatal. I don't remember if it was in lecture or if it was a supplemental video I was watching, but um, this, uh, it's, uh, it's a reaction and it's very fatal quickly. And so, but you can see a rash appear just all of a sudden appear on the patient. Um, so if you treat quickly with corticosteroids, the patient can make a full recovery and be good. But you'll see all of this stuff that it's affecting, um, necrotizing um, vasculitis and granulomas. Um, they can pass very quickly. So it's important that you see this. Um, it is um, mediated, I believe. And then Church Strauss, P. Anka, M. P. O. Anka. Um, again, need to know that for all of it. This is allergic 
granulomatosis. So anytime you see anything associated with allergic, you're going to see eosinophilia and you're going to see association with IgE. So you're going to have raised IgE. This is still granulomatous. Um, so the patient will present, they'll have recurrent asthma attacks, sinusitis, skin nodules, peripheral neuropathy. Um, but uh, no, look at the Incas. And then microscopic polyangitis. polyangitis. Um, you're going to have hemoptysis, which is coughing up blood, hematuria, blood in the urine, proteinuria, GI bleeding, myalgia weakness. So this is going to be a more after a, um, so after penicillins, that's what PCN stands for, penicillin, and then infection. So you do not have granulomas or eosinophils, but you're, this is still a hypersensitivity reaction. Okay, moving on, cardiac hypertrophy. So hypertrophy, hypertrophy um, this is more, this is a compensatory change. The heart just doesn't decide, oh, hey, I feel like I'm going to grow today. No, it's a compensatory mechanism to stress. And so you have concentric and eccentric. So concentric is going to be pressure overload on the ventricle. So hypertension, artery, um, aortic stenosis, my God, Liz. Um, aortic stenosis, because aortic stenosis, you're not going to have the stroke volume. So you're going to get the blood coming back into the heart. So you have just have a pressure overload. So sarcomeres are added in parallel. They're stacking on top of each other due to the pressure that they are having to endure. But that makes sense versus eccentric, because if you had a lot of pressure, you want to thicken so that you can withstand that pressure versus eccentric is due to volume overload. So what you're trying to do, you're adding them in series so that you have a bigger area to um, fill a larger volume. So in aortic regurgitation. Heart failure, the gist, um, Brady did a very nice big overview view, I condensed it down. So the just the heart can't pump enough blood. That's what it is. No matter what type of um, heart failure you have, the body is not getting enough blood to um, keep up with nutritional ox and oxygen demands. This is the end point of a lot of cardiac diseases. So again, this doesn't just happen overnight. You have a very steady chronic increase, and then you get to this point when the heart can no longer compensate um, for all of the uh, stuff that's happening. So it's called CHF, um, congestive heart failure, because lack of back up of blood causes congestion. So we'll talk about left versus right heart. Okay, so systolic can't contract versus diastolic, it can't fill and relax. Um, again, if you, Systolic, you're going to have myocyte loss. So for example, after a heart attack, and then you're going to have pressure overload. You can also have pressure overload during, um, due to hypertension. We talked about um, volume overload due to valve regurgitation, and this can cause that eccentric hypertrophy versus diastolic. And we can have, um, you're going to have pressure because if you can't um, relax and fill well, you have increased pressure. And so you can have the um, concentric hypertrophy. Um, Left-sided, so left ventricle is failing. You see this in hypertension. You can also see this in um, mitral and aortic valve diseases, ischemic heart diseases and cardiomyopathy. Right-sided, um, uh, the right ventricle is failing. This is due to diseases of the lung parenchyma, vasculature. COPD is a really big one. Corp Pulmonal. For pulmonal, it, um, you know that um, all of this is due to lung um, defects. And so if you have a right-sided heart failure, it's most likely because something's going wrong in the pulmonary system. And then high output versus low output, but um, we already talked about all that stuff. So again, compensated initially, um, the heart's going to change and react and so that you can maintain the cardiac output. But over time, this becomes burdensome and the myocardium fails and can't propel blood. Um, so how are they gonna present left heart failure? Um, it back, it's gonna back up into the lungs. So it goes right heart system, right heart, lungs, left heart. So if the left heart fails, then it's gonna back up into the pulmonary system. So that's when you're gonna get the shortness of breath or thought, proximal, nocturnal sleep. Um, 
So histologically, you're going to see congestion of the pulmonary or um, alveolar capillaries. Then right failure, again, it's backing up into the systemic system. So you're going to get jugular vein distension. You'll see hepatomegaly. They call it the nutmeg liver. You can see splenomegaly because it's all backing up into the systemic system. And then, of course, peripheral edema. OK, ischemic heart disease. Um, this is also known as coronary artery disease because it's causing the ischemia. Um, so anything that's causing an imbalance between blood supply and then oxygen demands of the heart. Most common cause, again, atherosclerosis because over time, not only are you um, narrowing the lumen because of a plaque, but you are narrowing the lumen because of um, possible stenosis of that lumen because of the plaque there. So. Um, you can have inadequate blood flow even at rest, which is a bad thing. So a thrombus, which is rupture of the plaque, you can lead to obstruction of flow. If it's complete, you can get a heart attack. If it's incomplete, angina. Classical presentations, angina versus acute coronary syndrome. Angina, um, it's um, not as um, concerning as a heart attack. So you have stable and principal variant. Um, and then unstable angina is under the category of acute coronary syndrome, and then end STEMI and STEMI, which those are heart attack, and we're going to go into all of those. So angina is a recurrent attack of chest pain due to ischemia, but this is transient ischemia. This, this doesn't lead to necrosis. So um, the reason you have pain is because this ischemia is going to lead to release of adenosine, bradykinin, which then stimulates the sympathetics. Um, uh, which will follow vagal afferent nerve. So um, notice that there is a difference in presentation and cause in each of these. That'll help you distinguish, okay, which one am I talking about? Stable, typical atherosclerosis is the big thing. So they're gonna have exertional chest pain. And so that gets better with rest or nitroglycerin. So any sort of vasodilator. Um, if you do a stress test, you can see ST depression, but you're not necessarily going to see it in the moment. You have to, you know, exertional chest pain, you have to elicit that response. You're also not going to see a rise in cardiac enzymes because this is only a schema, no infarction. If you have less than 30 minutes of um, ischemia, then it's reversible and it can go back if you don't have any damage and you're not going to see the after effects um, like you would in a heart attack. So less than 30 minutes, only ischemia. You're not going to get myocyte disruption. So it's not going to lead out, leak out the enzymes. So atherosclerosis, exertional chest pain that gets better. Principal or variant, this is due to vasospasm. So the risk factor here is smoking. So this is pain at rest. So a typical presentation is a, is a person that wakes up in the middle of the night with this chest pain. So awoken from sleep with chest pain. So, so remember this is at rest. So this is just a vasospasm. And the vasospasm of course is going to cause the ischemia because you're not getting as much blood um, flow, so. You will see transient ST elevations, but again, since we don't have that 30 minute threshold, you're not getting disruption of the myocytes, you're not getting the enzyme leakage into the serum, so there's no measurable um, cardiac enzymes that you're going to get. Now, acute coronary syndrome, this is where you get into the bad territory, and unstable angina, this is, um, so this is due to atherosclerosis, but this is a disrupted plaque. So this is an unstable plaque that has ruptured and you now throw a throm thrombi. So now stable, uh, unstable angina is an incomplete coronary artery conclusion. You're not getting the complete occlusion, but you are getting some. So what this is going to present with is pain that gets progressively worse with progressively less effort. So if one week you started getting chest pain when you were, you know, ran a mile versus the next week you started getting a chest pain when you just ran a few yards. So chest pain is getting worse with less and less and less effort. Um, so this will still respond to vasodilators, for example, nitroglycerin. This is pre-infarction. So you still have an occlusion. It's not complete inclusion, but you still have an inclusion. So this has a high incidence of subsequent MI because if you don't take care of the problem, you can get a complete coronary artery inclusion. This is just kind of like the preview to the chest pain. Um, 
So you can see ST depression and T-wave inversions, but again, we don't have, we only have ischemia. We don't have um, tissue cell death right now. So we're not getting the cardiac enzymes. Now, if you have prolonged ischemia, so 30 minutes or more, you're going to get the tissue death. And that's when you're going to have the disruption of the myocyte cell membranes. Then you're going to get leakage of the cardiac enzymes into the serum, which is when you can measure the cardiac enzymes, which is an indicator of myocyte cell death. Risk atherosclerosis, rupture of that plaque, giving you the thrombosis. Thrombosis then has complete occlusion. So you're not getting anything past that occlusion. That's why you have the ischemia and subsequent um, tissue cell death. So STEMI versus non-STEMI, the difference between these two um, is, is um, the EKG findings. So ST elevation MI versus non ST elevation MI. A STEMI is going to be full thickness versus N STEMI is going to be just the inner third of the ventricular wall. So it's transmural versus just that inner third. So you know, patient's going to present with retrosternal crushing chest pain, a bit a really common description that patients like to use is an elephant sitting on the chest. So Pain rating into the jaw, left shoulder, epigastrum. Again, longer than 30 minutes because 30 minutes is kind of the threshold where you're going to get that cardiomyocyte death. And then not relieved with nitroglycerin. Again, this is a complete occlusion. So vasodilation is not going to be able to adequately reperfuse the heart. And then shortness of breath, rapid weak pulse, diaphoresis, and nausea vomiting. Okay, this is extremely high yield and I'm gonna point out what I want you to know at each of this. Um, if you haven't already started using first aid religiously, I would highly recommend so because um, it has a lot of really good, it organizes it very well. Okay, so um, in the first 24 hours, coagulative necrosis, associate that with this. And then um, you can get reperfusion injury. So what this is, you basically get release of free radicals and you get an increase of calcium influx. So this stuns the myocardium. It goes into all of the myocyte, all the sarcomeres are going to go into tetany. So it's the stunning of the myocardium. That's what reperfusion injury is like, oh crap, oh it's here now. So we contract and everything's in tetany. That's what reperfusion injury is. But um, the coagulative necro necrosis that is due to the, um, escape, um, the cell death. So coagulative necrosis. And then big, 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 big complications. Remember, they love risk factors and complications. So pay attention to every single complication. Um, so you can get ventricular arrhythmias at this point. So if you are having um, infarction at an area it's in the ventricle, you um, can no longer pump well. And so if you get a ventricular arrhythmia, that is the most common cause of death in the first 24 hours after a heart attack because the heart is not going to have the same electrical um, um, what part am I trying to use? It, it's not going to be able to electrically handle itself. So ventricular arrhythmias is the most common cause of death in the first day after a heart attack. Um, then one to three days, um, you still extensive coagulative necrosis. You get a lot of neutrophilic infiltration. Um, what can happen here? You can get a post-infarction pericarditis right here. So this is just like an overwhelming amount of neutrophils that's coming, that's coming in here at one to three days. And then the neutrophils are cleared in, uh, by macrophages and you get granulation tissue. Now, this is where a lot of bad stuff happens. Why? Because granulation tissue is very weak. It's um, immature. It hasn't um, gained structural integrity. So you can get a lot of stuff here. You can get free ventricular wall rupture. How does this patient present with tamponade? So you're going to have distant heart sounds. You're going to have a low blood pressure. Um, and there's one more thing, but that's a big one. Free ventricular wall rupture, three to 14 days, because this granulation tissue is extremely weak. Um, papillary muscle rupture. So you can get mitral regurgitation. So one free, free wall rupture leading to tamponade. Two, you can get papillary muscle rupture, which is going to lead to mitral regurgitation. You can get interventricular septal rupture. 
And then you can get a pseudo aneurysm. So there's a lot of stuff that can happen because this granulation tissue has um, so much less star structural integrity um, than it used to. Hey, Lindsay. Uh, yeah. Lindsay, you, you brought up a really important point. Can you go back to that slide? Because uh, we yeah. this this question keeps coming up, right? They, they're going to tell you a patient had a myocardial infarction. They were sent home about seven to 10 days later. They present with dyspnea, difficulty breathing, and then they give you that triad, uh, uh, hypotension, muffled heart sounds, uh, uh, jugular venous distension, okay? They're going to ask you what happened. You're going to be like, well, the patient has cardiac tampon on. Why? Rupture of the free of the free wall of the left ventricle. Literally, the left ventricle tears open and all of the blood goes into the pericardial sac. Okay, so we've had this, it's coming up again now that we're talking about it, but make sure you know that because you'll probably get a test question on it. Yeah, definitely. You definitely will probably. Okay. So two weeks to several months later, you have a complete scar now. So the thing here, um, you can get Dressler's syndrome. So this is an autoimmune reaction that occurs 10 to 14 days. It's autoantibodies um, directed towards the pericardial antigen. So Dressler's syndrome at this point. And then a very late complication. So we're talking like a year later, a very late complication is ventricular aneurysm. So, um, so complication of large transmural infarct. So that would be a STEMI, ST elevated, ST elevation of myocardial infarction. So scar tissue, of course, it's not gonna have the same structural integrity. It's gonna bulge during systole. You can get a mural thrombus, highlight that word. Um, arrhythmias and heart failure can, inter can occur. Now, what can you do to test for MI? The first biomarker is myoglobin, but this is not specific at all. So this is not you. So no, it exists, but the, light, the likelihood of them testing you on it because it's not used is kind of low, but no, it's there just in case they want to throw that in on you. Troponins, of course, are the most specific and they will rise in state risen for a few days. And so a patient can come in a week later and they will still have troponins um, elevated. Now, what happens if they have a new heart attack? How do you know? Well, it's the CKMB. CKMB rises for a lot of reasons, um, but it's a good indication of reinfarction because it's going to go away quickly. It's going to rise kind of with the troponins right after the troponins, but it's going to it's going to go away very quickly. So if a patient comes back in a week they have similar pain to what they had and they had a heart attack, troponins are still going to be up. But if you, uh, if CKMB is high, then you know that um, they're having another heart attack. Something else that's going to be increased, um, lactic dehydrogenase. Um, why? Because myocyte death. Myocyte death. Remember that why are we even getting these serum markers? Well, it's because it, they, um, the cells died, the cell membrane was um, structurally um, damaged, and then you're releasing all of these things into the serum that you can measure. One of those things is lactate. So you will see an increase in LDH. And then EKG, what can you see? STEMI, you're going to see ST elevations, pathologic Q waves, which are going to persist. You'll learn this in term five, but um, if you see a Q wave on an, um, on an EKG, it's indication of a past MI. But for your purposes right now, I don't think that's a huge thing. And then N STEMI, so it's non-ST elevation. So it just, you're not going to see that, but you can see a T wave inversion. And then chronic ischemic heart disease. Um, so again, remember heart failure is gonna be the end point of a lot of cardiac issues. So if you have chronic ischemic heart disease, Brady talked about you can get MI, 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 or you can get a lot of anginal attacks because anginal attacks are still causing stress on the heart. You can get heart failure. Um, decompensation, good, what did I? good tissue. Oh, I know what I was trying to say. Um, you can have decompensation because the good tissue gets tired. So you have dead tissue 
after an MI, you know, you get that scar, the scar doesn't have the same structural integrity, nor does it have this electrical integrity that it used to. So all of the good tissue that's remaining in the heart has to work a little bit harder to compensate for the loss, but that tissue is going to get tired because now they're having to do more work over time. So you can get decompensation and you're going to get chronic ischemic heart disease. And then it's um, severe obstructive disease. Um, so you have um, diffuse dis dysfunction. Sudden so cardiac death, um, just unexpected death without symptoms. This is the most common cause is going to be coronary artery disease in adults. Um, what is the mechanism? You're going to get <laughs> left ventricular fibrillation. That's another um, hand <laughs> dyslexia there, but that's the most common cause of sudden cardiac death is a left ventricular fibrillation. Valvular heart disease, we're going to go into these. So all of these are valvular diseases. So you have your murmurs that we've gone into before. So aortic stenosis and regurgitation, mitral stenosis and regurgitation, and then rheumatic fever can affect the valves and so can infective endocarditis. So briefly going back over these, um, uh, so mitral stenosis, a big thing that's in rheumatic heart disease. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Aortic stenosis, this is more wear and tear. So this is calcific um, aortic stenosis. This, is, this isn't necessarily due to any specific pathology. It's just wear and tear. And so like Brady said, if you have an older patient coming in, they have this murmur, you can probably um, say that they have aortic stenosis. Mitral regurgitation, this can, a lot of things can actually lead to mitral regurgitation. Um, and then aortic regurgitation. Um, these are your symptoms and signs for these. They're, um, will hit really hard later on aortic stenosis and mitral regurgitation, regurgitation. That's why I'm not sitting on these slides for very long, because this is kind of the reintroduction of these concepts to you from CPR, but it goes into more detail in aortic stenosis and mitral regurg later. So rheumatic heart disease, this is big, 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 big. You need to understand this. Um, so the patient is going to come in with a past strep infection. So strep pyogenes is the biggest one. So highlight that. It is going to be a type 2 hypersensitivity reaction. And the big thing here, again, um, highlight molecular mimicry. So the antibodies to M proteins. So this is the molecular mimicry. That's why you're getting this um, autoimmune reaction. Mitral valve. Um, this is the most commonly effective than aortic and tricuspid. Um, so if you have chronic rheumatic heart disease, you can end up with mitral stenosis. Um, remember I told you histo is your friend in year two. So ask off bodies and um, I don't know how to pronounce that, but um, I put a picture I found on Google on the right. But if, if it mentions either of these cells, you know you're talking about rheumatic heart disease automatically. It's a buzzword. Also big anti, um, oh, I forgot what that stands for, but ASO and then anti-DNA um, B in serum. And then Jones criteria, these are the major criteria. So this is what you're going to see in the presentation. You're going to have migratory polyarthritis in the mainly the large joints. And then you're going to have a carditis, nodules in the skin, erythema, um, marginatum. I, I feel like the rash was such a huge thing that they focused on in, in the case. So that's what can clue you in on. And then synonym chorea. Complications, again, complications are really big. Um, you can have a lot of things that come from this. But biggest things you need to focus in on, group A strep, molecular mimicry, um, proteins, the ASCOF bodies, and then the serum. Calcific aortic stenosis. Again, this is wear and tear. Um, or another cause can be a congenital bicuspid valve. Um, so highlight that one too. So repeated hyperlipidemia, hypertension, and inflammatory injury to the valve, you're going to get degeneration. And then you have the deposition of hydroxyabotate, which of course then impairs the structural integrity um, and you get this stenosis. So what are you going to see? Um, these calcified mass, masses on the outflow surfaces of the cusps, um, but the free edges are not involved. I feel like that was something that they um, hit on 
for us. And then the clinical features down there, it, you have this triad of chest pain, syncope, and, and I can't read the last one there because my Zoom is, um, is blocking it off. But that's your cl cl um, clinical presentation if they start talking about this. Um, uh, congenital bicuspid is a risk or wear and tear. Myxomatous mitral valve. Um, this is this is mitral valve prolapse, so um, connective tissue defect. Um, so patient will come in, they'll have palpitations and fit, um, fatigue and chest pain. The biggest thing you're going to hear that mid systolic clit is because this. Um, is, is a systolic murmur. Then complications, you can have um, mitral regurgitation, uh, CHF, and then infective endocarditis, and then the arrhythmias, which it, uh, the ventricular arrhythmias are gonna be the cause of sudden cardiac disease. And infective, Lindsay, yeah. And I, I just wanted to uh, point something out that I found confusing. It took me a while to kind of grasp this. Um, so when they talk about um, things that increase preloaded, increase afterload, you know, such as um, like when, when kids have tetralogy of flow and they squat down. Um, so they're gonna talk about these murmurs when they, the questions get a little more complicated. They're gonna talk about things that increase preload, increase afterload, and those are always going to make the murmurs louder, right? That should make sense. Anytime you have more blood going to the heart that are going through those, those, um, those diseased valves or anything time you have afterload, you take a regurgitation, for example, there, there's more blood that's gonna regurgitate. That's all, so anything that increases preload or afterload is going to increase the sound of the murmur, except in mitral valve prolapse. It's not super important why, but uh, with mitral valve prolapse, it's opposite. So anytime you increase preload or afterload, it'll actually decrease the sound of the murmur. So take, for example, uh, doing the Valsalva maneuver, that's actually a process of decreasing preload, okay? So if they say a patient uh, does the Valsalva maneuver and the, the, the uh, murmur gets louder, it, uh, it's, in, it's mitral valve prolapse. Okay, so the, uh, just for completeness sake, uh, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, if y'all come to that, that and mitral valve prolapse are opposite, okay? So all murmurs will get louder with increased preload or afterload, except MVP and uh, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. Uh, that'll help you answer some of the more difficult questions. Mm, yeah. Okay, infective endocarditis, um, infection of the heart valves. There is a difference between acute and subacute. Acute is a rapid onset presentation. This is a previously normal valve and it's um, S. aureus vegetations. And this is very common with in history of IV drug abuse. Um, so that's a buzzword right there, history of IV um, drug abuse. And then subacute, slow onset, most likely varied in strep. To cockeye, and then um, so something here, common sequelae of a dental procedure. So look in the patient's history because the history is going to be very indicative of what you can expect for it. So the hallmark of this, you're going to have vegetations on the heart valve, which make the valve friable and bulky. And these vegetations are going to contain fibrin and inflammatory cells and bacteria. They can erode the underlying myocardium and they're gonna form ring abscesses. And these are also prone to embolizations because it's this foreign material there. So it can fragment and you can get um, the virulent organism to a distant site and it can cause mycotic aneurysms at a distant site. Now, remember we talked about the different types of organisms. We talked briefly about mycotic aneurysms. And so how are you gonna get those mycotic aneurysms? Because it's a thrombi, it's embolized from a, a vegetation on the heart valve and infective endocarditis and it can seed. And when it does that, it's going to compromise the structural integrity of that area. Um, there are some others. So we talked about strep viridans and we talked about S. aureus. Strep bovis is associated with colon cancer for some reason. And then you do have this um, hot, I, I don't know how to say it, but um, this other group. Um, so commensals of the oral activity. Um, 
Um, but we're going to go over this more when we get into the micro stuff. This is more of just an introduction um, to this. Uh, so this is the pathogenesis of this. Oh, I put this on here because of the symptoms. So you can have various symptoms with infective endocarditis. So constitutional, of course, because if you have an infection in the system, um, you're going to have fever, you're going to have malaise, and then inflammation, you know, increase ESR and CRP, um, arthralgias, myalgias, all of those things. Um, yeah. Okay, so more highlight these. You're gonna have clubbing of the fingers. You're gonna have splinter, splinter hemorrhages, Osler's nodes, Janeway nodes, Roth spots. If they mention any of these, which they most likely will, or they'll describe them. So I'm giving you the names. They might describe them to you instead of telling you what it is. So tender sub, sub Q nodule, non-tender macula on the palms and soles. Um, that's gonna clue you in. And on, okay, this is infective endocarditis. Um, so again, you have acute and subacute, which are going to have different presentations. And then how do you diagnose this is the, mod the modified Duke. Um, so if I remember correctly, they'll ask you like, um, how would you confirm this diagnosis or something along those lines or which of the following would help you? I don't remember, but um, just understand the modified Duke criteria. Okay, non-bacterial thrombotic endocarditis. So this is gonna be a sterile thrombus. Remember in the infective endocarditis, those vegetations did have um, the organisms inside. So they had the fibrin, they had the leukocytes and they had lymphocytes and then they had the um, organisms. So this is a sterile thrombi. Again, um, complication, you can't have emboliz embolization, but you can also get infective endocarditis down the line. Um, so this is eosinic, eosinophilic materials. So you're gonna have fibrin in there, aggregated platelets, loosely attached to the cups, loosely attached so you can get the embolization. And you do not have association of the surrounding tissue. That's important too. Um, the last couple, this one, it just, it didn't have a lot on there. I don't even think we were asked about it, but of course, for completion's sake, these are also sterile vegetations, but this is in the setting of lupus, in the setting of SLE. So just understand that um, you can have the ver um, sterile vegetations in this. And then it's going to be a consequence of the immune complement deposition, and then you get subsequent um activation of complement. So that's what it's associated with. Um, and then prostatic valve disease. I think I put in this on here for um, completion sake. Um, but they talk a lot more about the significance of this in the micro slides. Um, and then yes, please understand that all of these are going to have different distributions of the vegetations on the valve and it is important. So rheumatic heart disease is along the lines of closure. Um, infective endocarditis, it's on the cusps and can extend to the cordae tendinae. Um, NBTE along the lines of closure and then um, LSE is on both sides of the leaflet. Okay. So systemic hypertensive disease. Okay, so early you um asymptomatic because you're um it, it remember malignant hypertension is going to be a very um steep increase in blood pressure and you're gonna automatically get um, damage from that. But if you have benign hypertension, it happens over the time, over time. So your body has time to compensate for what's going on. So early stages are going to be asymptomatic because your body, um, has a lot of time to adjust to it. Um, angina, um, signs of left heart failure. I don't remember putting why I put this on here. Okay, but concentric hypertrophy of the, of the left ventricle, remember, concentric hypertrophy is due to a pressure overload. So you are going to get a thicker wall to accommodate for the pressure. Um, and then long standing, you're gonna get right ventricular hypertrophy because if your left heart fails, your right heart's going to fail too. 
Um, and then the boxcar shaped nuclei in the myocytes is big from that. Okay, versus pulmonary. So also called core pulmonale. So this is heart disease caused by a pulmonary, um, the origin of the disease is pulmonary. It's not from the heart. Um, so um, you're gonna have a defect in the right cardiac chambers. Um, so pulmonary parenchymal disease, pulmonary vascular diseases. So when you get that congestion, it backs up into um, the heart and that's why you're getting that. Um, acute core pulmonale, again, that's just saying that this is due to um, the lungs. Um, COPD is a big, big, big cause of this. Um, highlight that, they love to focus on that. Okay, I forgot to put more on the slide because I was gonna go to the micro and then back to this. Um, but there's like one slide on each type of the myocarditis. Um, just go through there. It's not complicated. But when it talks about the micro, which we're going to go over later, that's where it gets deep. And that's why I apologize. I didn't finish that slide. Um, then you have cardiomyopathy, different kinds of cardiomyopathy. So this is just disease of the myocardium. And it's due to mechanical or electrical dysfunction. There are different types. Dilated. Um, so you have... People upstairs are being loud. Um, so progressive dilation. And if you have dilation, you're also gonna get systemic um, dysfunction. Um, so you have left um, ventricular hypertrophy. Again, if you have hypertrophy, that's a compensation over time. You're going to get decompensation. You can get heart failure. Um, so this is autosomal dominant inheritance pattern. Um, so you can get mutations of the cytoskeletal proteins, or it can be X-linked, um, and it can, um, mutations in dystrophin. Um, a big risk factor is alcohol. If you have viral dilated cardiomyopathy, a big, big, big one is Coxsackie B, and then a complication, neural thrombus um, due to contractile dysfunction. Arrhythmogenic right ventricular, so inherited, it can cause sudden cardiac death. Um, the mutation is in the desmosomal um, junctional proteins, which is pl placoglobin. So the desmosomes can detach during exercise and you can get cardiomyopathy. Then hypertrophic cardiomyopathy um, and then restrictive. For restrictive, it's essentially anything that's going to cause a, an actual obstruction of the pumping of the heart. So amyloidosis, sarcoidosis, radiation-induced fibrosis, so anything that um, can restrict the pumping action of the heart. Okay, so hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, um, just more information on this. So again, gain of function mutations, um, you, the big thing here is you end up with microfiber, myofiber disarray. That's a big, big, big highlight that star that, um, and then fibroblast proliferation. Um, so the big thing here is you can get sudden death. Pericarditis, this is disease of the sac surrounding the heart. Um, if it happens over the time, heart can, can accommodate again, just you know, same with hypertension, if given time, you have this slow accommodation, but if it, um, if there is a sudden change, for example, a hemorrhage, uh, um, a rupture, you, uh, you get accumulation in the stack and you get compression. So this is an inflammation. So a sudden change. And so you, are going to get compression on the heart. And so the patient is gonna present, um, the chest pain is gonna get worse when you lean back and relieve when you move forward. And something that's indicative of this is a high pitched friction rub. And this can progress to chronic pericarditis where you can get right-sided venous distension and low car um, cardiac output. Okay, congenital heart diseases. Um, I put this on here as more of an introduction, um, but understand the pathology behind right to left and left to right sided shunt because this is going to determine what these symptoms are in the presentation. So if you have left to right, 
you're increasing the pulmonary flow because it's not getting to systemic circulation. Um, and so pulmonary artery undergoes fibrotic intimal thickening. That's the compensation right there. And then you'll have medial hypertrophy and vasoconstriction. Um, you can get pulmonary hypertension later, and then right ventricle is going to be um, hypertrophy. But then right to left side of the heart, this is where you're getting the hypoxia and cyanosis because you're bypassing that pulmonary circulation. So um, left to right shunts, you have the ASDs, which is an opening in the atrial septum, VSDs, incomplete closure, big, 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 big thing here. It's associated with the, the trisomy, so 21, 13, 18. Um, you can get pulmonary hypertension, CHF, but you're going to hear a pansystolic murmur. If you see in the vignette that um, the pansystolic murmur, it's going to clue you in on the VSD. Um, if it is large and it does not close, you get an irreversible pulmonary vascular disease. If you have um, shunt, not sunt, shunt reversal and cyanosis, that's called the Eisenmenger um, complex. And then PDA um, in utero, it allows blood to bypass non-functional lungs. You don't want lungs to um, perfuse, you don't want blood to perfuse lungs that um, aren't being oxygenated, that just won't be good. And so, but after birth, it will close within one to two days. Um, but a persistent um, ductus arteriosus is associated with rubella infection in the mother. Highlight that, star it. Um, that's a big, big, big one. And then um, you're in a, the vignette is going to show a harsh machine like murmur, murmur. And then um, you can give endomethacin to close up. Right to left, the child AGF below, um, the three characteristics, you have VAD, supplemonic, um, or no, three, mm -hmm. and stenosis, overriding aorta, and then right ventricular hypertrophy. Big, big, big association with downs is your risk factor. And then you can, um, it can lead to an increased risk of infective endocarditis and embolization. Transposition, so aorta and pulmonary artery kind of switch where they're coming from. So you create this parallel circulation. This is incompatible with life um, unless you have a shunt to provide mixing because the thing is you're not getting oxygenated blood to the systemic circulation. And so you have hypo like generalized hypoxia. And then truncus arteriosis um, failure of partitioning. Okay, obstructive um, congenital um, disease, uh, malformation, coarctation of the aorta. Again, associated with Turner's, anytime we have that, it's big, big, big. So coarctation um, risk factor, it's associated with Turner's. Um, so two types, preductal versus postductal. Um, the biggest thing here, just um, that association. Cardiac myxoma, cardiac tumor that can fragment and embolize. Um, but um, big thing here, um, this can cause an obstruction of the AV valve, which can lead to syncope and sudden death. Metastatic tumors, they are always to the heart. They're not from the heart. So you can have a primary tumor in the lung breast, um, melanoma, leukemia, lymphoma, and then it can, um, you can get METs from those cancers that go to the heart. Renal path, um, nephrotic versus nephritic. I don't know why in term four, this took me so long to understand. We're going over it again now. I'm like, this, this just makes so much more sense. So nephrotic, um, I remember this because nephrotic ROT, proteinuria, um, but essentially you get podocyte damage. So you have an impaired charge barrier. And the biggest, biggest thing is you're going to have proteinuria. So it's more than 3.5 grams daily. So that's going to be your big thing. If you're looking at the vignette and they have um, the more than 3.5, it's a nephrotic syndrome. You're going to have, now, if you have a protein coming out in the urine, conversely, you're going to have hypoalbuminemia. So you're going to have low protein in the blood and then you get edema. Why do you get edema? Well, you're losing all your protein in your blood. And remember, protein is one of those things that is involved in the hemodynamics. So if you don't have any protein in the blood, then all the fluid is going to come out of your blood into the interstitium and 
And that's how you're going to get edema. So it makes sense. Proteins leaving your body. You don't have protein in your body. Hemodynamics are messed up and you get fluid leaking from your vessels into the interstitium causing edema. So a patient comes in, they have edema, they have proteinuria, and then whatever other characteristics of the individual disease. But that's why you have this kinds of presentation. You're also going to see lipiduria in the form of fatty casts. So um, the, the urine is very likely frothy with fatty casts, and you will see hyperlipidemia. And these patients are also going to see an increased risk of infection and thrombosis. Why? Because not only are you um, losing protein in your urine, you're also reading, you're also losing antithrombin-3 and IgG in the urine. So antithrombin-3, now you're going to be in, um, it's going to lead you to thrombosis more likely than IgG, of course. Then nephritic. So this is more inflammation of the glomerular, um, of the glomerulus. Then you get glom um, glomerular basement membrane damage. And so you're losing red blood cells in the urine. So you're going to see gross hematuria. Um, you're still going to have loss of protein, but it's not going to be in that nephritic range. So it's going to be below 3.5. Other big features you are going to have a decrease in GFR leading to oliguria. Oliguria is just a decrease of urine output. This makes sense though, because if your glomerular if your glomerulus is um, damaged, you're not getting good um, filtration of the, of the blood. And so you're going to have a decreased GFR. You're going to get oliguria. And then because of this, because you're decreasing GFR, because, um, you have this, you're going to get increase in the run and release, and then you can get hypertension down the line. So let's go over the minimal change disease. I pulled out the different pieces of information that you need to know. So minimal change, look for a kid that hey, Lindsay. had yeah let's take a little break oh, okay and then what i think we should do um let me go through so you can have a break let me go through the cardiac drugs and stuff and then we'll go to the real okay. stuff okay Sounds let's good. take a five minute break for you guys and then we'll come back you did great <laughs> all right now Lindsay's very nice to you guys and made slides um <laughs> I'm just gonna go through my notes um, um, that I had for last term. I did go ahead and post all of these so y'all could see how I highlighted everything. But we're gonna go pretty quickly through this just because um, we wanna get to the renal stuff too, okay? So um, some of this is overlap, right? So we talked about the um, infective endocarditis, we talked about rheumatic heart disease. Just remember, what you need to remember is pretty much what the, what the first line um, um, uh, bacteria or causal agent is for these different um, um, lesions, right? And remember, effective endocarditis, uh, Osler's nose are tender, Janeway lesions, hands and uh, palms um, are gonna be non-tender and raw spots show up in the eye. So they'll typically give you that for infective endocarditis, um, I know, you know, I, I used to make a big deal of trying to remember this criteria, but I've never come across problems where they're like, did they technically qualify with the major and minor? So, you know, that's my two cents on like, you know, actually learning these, um, like this and stuff. So, right. So this would be at a very important slide. Uh, for the native valve endocarditis, what's going to be most common. Remember, they like to talk about IV drug users. Remember, that means they're injecting, uh, um, they're using um, a needle to inject directly into their venous system. So that staph aureus that's on your skin gets in there. The first valve that, um, that, that staph aureus that was recently injected gets to is the tricuspid valve. So classically, if they talk about um, either an IV drug user, or sometimes I'll say people that are on hemodialysis because they have to get a lot of, um, you know, to do hemodialysis, you have to have venipuncture. So they'll talk about that valve. It's typically staph, right? Okay, so here we're, when we're looking at endocarditis, we have strep, uh, enterococcus, those HACEC organisms are like 5%, not terribly important. And then prostatic valves, um, you, you could see the staph is very common here. Um, even the coagulase negative ones. Remember strep viridans, if they ever talk about a patient that had a recent dental procedure, uh, they have to be at, and they have a heart valve uh, transplant, 
um, they have to be on a significant prophylaxis, okay, because that strep viridans in the mouth is, uh, can lead to, um, can lead to um, infective endocarditis. I think they're having a party outside. I don't know in my apartment. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, so you see here, staph and strep are the big ones. So if it came down to it, pick between those two. All right. And then these are just characteristics of the, the bacteria that you learned about before. And then these are strep viridans, mutans and sanguinis. Uh, and remember, those are dental dental procedures or bad dental hygiene. All right. All right. Let's see. Yeah. So rheumatic heart disease. Remember, you have uh, typically a kid uh, had a recent sore throat. Week or so later, um, getting uh, heart problems. Uh, it's that molecular mimicry. Remember, when you go and test these kids to see if they have rheumatic heart disease, they will not have strep pyogenes in their blood, okay? The blood cultures will come back negative. It's very important because the, 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 staff, uh, sorry, excuse me, the strep pyogenes is not causing the actual damage to the heart valve, particularly the mitral valve. It's actually this molecular mimicry. The body makes autoantibodies um, that uh, attack the, 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 the valve, similarly to if, if rheumatic heart, or excuse me, if, they would attack the valve similarly to if strep pyogenes was there, but the blood cultures will come back negative, okay? You can see enterococcus also, um, right, both different valves. What did we get to? Okay, let's see. And then these HACEC organisms too. Right, so those are very, you know, 5%. So not terribly important, but if they come up. All right, and then myocarditis, uh, you can see here, it's obviously the muscle tissue, viral causes, you need to think of Coxsackie B. B is for body, Coxsackie A does like hand, foot and mouth disease. So remember Coxsackie B is the big one here. Uh, they have fungal causes. Remember, fungal infections, typically the patient has to be immunocompromised. So if they say immunocompromised, they're probably leading you down the road to go to a fungal infection. Trypanosoma, Chagas disease. Remember, when I think trypanosoma, I think um, dilation. It causes dilated cardiomyopathy, okay? So that's, that's what that's going to cause in South American Chagas. Toxoplasmus as well, immunocompromised. That's when we talk about, isn't that the cat? Uh, I think that has to do with the cat, the cat feces, toxoplasm. Yeah, I think so. Don't correct me if I'm wrong. Um, okay, pericarditis. Remember, if you have this friction rub, uh, when you when you listen to the stethoscope with the stethoscope, it, it um, feels scratchy. You can get effusions there. They all typically they'll say the patient feels better and relief when they're leaning forward. Okay, that's classic for pericarditis. You can see both Coxsackie B A and B there and then some other viral causes uh, classically. Um, even some immunocompromised, some fungi and stuff. All right, and then here would be a good um, summary slide for everything. All right, cool. Now, um, if y'all were like me, uh, the diuretics kind of made sense, so we'll go through those quickly. I think what I had the most trouble with was their antiarrhythmics. Now, in term five, we actually went through all of the arrhythmias and looked at them on EKGs. So why they teach you the antiarrhythmic drugs in term four and you actually learn the arrhythmias in term five, I don't know. But when we get to the antiarrhythmics, I will tell you uh, what you need to know for the questions that they're gonna ask. Because I went into the exam being like, if they tell me it's like atrial fibrillation, I don't know what drug to give. But that's not how they tested. They tested on saying like, which one prolongs QT and like you want to give one that is good for, um, you know, extending QRS. So that's what we'll look at there. But quickly, we could run through the diuretics. So remember diuretics, um, good for the heart, uh, good for your, your, your vessels. You got to get, um, get the fluid off, uh, good for the renal system as well. Um, so it, the, that's why CR, you know, cardio and renal are together because they, they kind of work in conjunction with the, the whole volume regulation. 
Okay, so typically when we talk about uh, either heart failure or renal problems or hypertension, uh, the first line drug you wanna give is a diuretic. All right, so let's get to the actual drugs. Now, loop diuretics are super strong. Okay, so they're not first line, but if a patient comes in in a congestive heart failure, like full-blown like left heart failure has dyspnea, dyspnea because there's fluid in the lungs, has right heart failure because of that, and now has peripheral edema, you just give them a loop diuretic. You give a furosemide, that's Lasix. You give it to them right away because you need to get all the fluid off. But when you're talking about just regulating uh, high blood pressure, you don't give a loop diuretic first. It, they'll, they'll, they'll bottom out, right? They'll, 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 they'll get orthostatic hypertension. You just, it's not, just not a first line for that. But when you think about heart failure and all of the, you know, the peripheral edema, you definitely want to give it. So when you think of loop diuretics, think of it, it being really strong, okay? So management for edema. Um, just a good thing to know, they, use, they are used on these channels here, the sodium chloride uh, potassium channel, this co-transporter, okay? And they obviously uh, work in the, um, the loop of Henley. Super important to know these, uh, you know, my highlighting by now probably, uh, you know, red is super important, green's, you know, a little less important and yellow's a little less. So some of these are gonna be um, more important than others. Um, and a good good thing that they actually increase renal blood flow down down the line. That's we you learn about that in term five. So um, let's see. Obviously, these adverse effects are going to be super important too. Ototoxicity. Okay, it changes the fluid balance in the in the ear canal. So uh, ototoxicity is a big one. And then some of these other ones. You definitely want to remember these hypokalemia kalemia versus some of the diuretics that work downstream are going to be um, potassium sparing, okay? Um, and watch out for the allergic reactions with sulfur drugs. Okay, so good little explanation here. All right, so thiazides, they're great first line drugs. Uh, HCTZ is typically the one they use, hydrochlorothiazide, works down in the distal tubule. The big question they always ask, it probably should be in red here. It causes hyper, uh, I'm sorry, it causes hypercalcemia. All right, so if you take a thiazide and then you check your blood, you'll have elevated calcium in your blood. It causes hypercalcemia, uh, which is why it's good for treatment of hypercalciuria. If you have a lot of calcium in your urine and you wanna pull it out of your urine and you know, get it out of there, um, you can give a thiazide. So people that have chronic kidney stones, calcium kidney stones, you can give them a thiazide and it'll get, uh, it'll get all that calcium off um, out of their urine back into the blood. But thiazides are very classic, prototypical for something that causes hypercalcemia, okay? So make sure you know that. And just so you know, they work on these sodium chloride co-transporters down in the distal tubule. And I, I remember, um, uh, I remember that they, they, they deal with calcium causing hypercalcemia because remember PTH works down in the distal tubule too. So that kind of all, that kind of puts it together for me. All right, so you can see the hypercalcemia. That's pretty much the big one you need to know there. Um, again, can cause hypokalemia, just like loops, right? Increase potassium excretion. All right, and that'll be different from the potassium sparing ones. Now, stuff like this, like I did highlight it, but honestly, like if you asked me in, in the exam if I knew that, I did not. Like, you know, um, it's one of those things. I don't go back after the test and change my highlighting, but. Uh, things like that in numbers and stuff sometimes, uh, you know, it's not, not terribly important. All right. So again, hypercalcemia, if it's not written on your slide, that would be the big one uh, to, to know. And then, oh, the, actually the, um, the mnemonic for this is uh, GLUX. Let me just put it here for you guys. G-L-U-C, GLUX-S. So it's, it causes hyperglycemia, lipidemia, uricemia, hypercalcemia, and hypersensitivity, okay? So what's important here, watch this for diabetic patients, okay? It's a good question to ask. Probably don't want to use it, right? Use something else. ACE inhibitors are good, right? They're renal protective for those diabetic patients. Okay, so glux is the, the way to remember that one. All right. 
Now, potassium sparing, the, the way to remember these is it's sealed. S E A L, I believe. Yeah, so these first two are aldosterone receptor antagonists. Um, what's very specific about these, they cause anti androgenic effects. So they can cause like um, uh, gynecomastia and stuff. Okay, but they're also potassium sparing. Uh, if you're not using aldosterone, that the potassium, that sodium potassium exchanger isn't going to work. So you're going to pee out a lot of sodium and you're going to hold on to that potassium. Okay, and then the other one, well, amylaride, what's the alpha? Amylaride. Hold on. Oh, I'm sorry, it's it's seat, not seal, it's seat. S-E-A-T, and triamterine is the other one. Okay, hold on, let me go back. Um, all right, so just remember potassium sparing, the ones that work on aldosterone, they have anti-androgenic effects, okay? It's like gynecomastia. And then anytime you're messing with holding on to too much sodium, um, excuse me, or too much potassium, uh, you're at risk for arrhythmias. Remember, that's a big problem, either hyper or hypokalemia, you have to watch out for arrhythmias. Very important, we'll get to in a little bit. Uh, you may not, um, it may not be intuitive, it's not to me, but spironolactone is one of those drugs that is, um, it helps to prevent cardiac remodeling, okay? So there are a couple of drugs um, somebody could throw it in the chat if they want, but I think we're going to come up to it. A couple of drug classes are um, prevent cardiac remodeling, which is very important because cardiac remodeling causes systolic and diastolic dysfunction, right? So by definition, these drugs such as ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, spironolactone, uh, I believe maybe calcium channel blockers is the other one, they all prevent cardiac remodeling. So they all technically um, um, help with longer lifespan, right? Cardiac remodeling is, is the definition of heart failure, okay? So these drugs are very important, um, but it may not be intuitive that spironolactone is one of those, but it is, okay? So things like digoxin is not, like even though you think, well, it's helping contract the heart and work better, it's only for systemic, excuse me, for symptomatic um, relief. Okay. Let's see, right. Um, yeah, anti-androgenic effects. Obviously hyperkalemia, right? To be able to recognize that in the lab value. And then we have the ones that work on the ENAC channels, amylaride and triamterene. Uh, not super important, but they're there. So again, they are potassium sparing. They're gonna prevent that exchange from sodium and uh, potassium. All right. And then carbanic anhydrase, acetazolamide, uh, basically just um, helps to uh, prevent bicarb. Uh, it's to prevent bicarb. Mm. You, you pee out bicarb, right? Uh, is retained in the lumen, yes. Okay, so it prevents um, uh, reuptake of, of bicarbonate, right? So these are when you would wanna use that. Mountain sickness makes sense because if you're in respiratory alkalosis from hyperventilating, uh, you can use carbonic anhydrase. You'll pee out a lot of the bicarb and it'll acidify the blood and try to bring you back to baseline. Okay, so that's all you really need to know for that. Right, uh, well, yeah. Um, yeah, so obviously if you're peeing out a lot of bicarb, you'll end up in metabolic acidosis. Crystal stones, yeah. yeah, I don't know how important that is. All right, good. Again, I know I'm going kind of fast. If y'all have anything I wanna bring up, just stop me. Osmotic diuresis, um, this will help, mannitol helps to bring all the water into the urine. Um, it's an osmotic agent, so it'll bring a lot of uh, fluid in so you could pee it out, not really used. They, won't, they probably won't ask you about that. Okay. Uh, ADH, this is not super important either, um, but ADH, right, remember, free, brings free water back into the body. So if you have something like syndrome of inappropriate, uh, SIADH of inappropriate ADH, you know, you can give something like this, right? There you go. 
And then you have your charts. If you're a chart person, go with that. All right, now anti hypertensives, you know the staging by now. They could ask you that, but make sure or, or pimp you in uh, when you're doing small group with that. But this is what you should go with. Some 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 textbooks or websites will give you differences. This is the standard that SGU uses, okay, for stage one and stage two or prehypertensive. Well, they don't they don't even call it prehypertensive anymore. Just stage one and stage two. All right. So again, with uh, we're not going to go through how all this how, you know all this works. I want to just talk about the drugs. Um, right. So current treatments. All right. So again. If you're in heart failure, you want to decrease, you don't want to be in volume overload, you want to decrease the volume. So first line agents such as ACE inhibitors are going to be very important. You need to know which ones are first line, which ones are second line and whatnot. Okay, so these all fall together. Remember, you never give an ACE inhibitor and an ARB together. They basically work the same. Okay, so you're going to give one of these two, throw a calcium channel blocker and a thiazide, uh, you'll be good to go. You can also add a beta blocker and something like spironolactone too if you need to. All right, um, and then ACE inhibitors, you pretty much know how this works now. They're gonna help to block aldosterone downstream, or it's gonna block angiotensin two, and angiotensin two can, uh, will activate aldosterone and ADH. So if you block, uh, if you use an ACE inhibitor to block angiotensin two, uh, you can help prevent the reuptake of fluid, and you can help prevent that vasoconstriction from, um, um, angiotensin two, right? So it's a twofold effect. Big thing with ACE inhibitors, they, uh, they increase bradykinin. Bradykinin will cause a dry cough. It'll also cause angioedema. So if that happens, you just switch the patient. If, if the patient comes in with a dry cough, you switch the patient from an ACE inhibitor to an ARB. No big deal. Okay. You can see y'all all know now how aldosterone works through this process. All right. Now, super important, um, it's very good for uh, diabetic patients, ACE inhibitors, it's pretty much first line for everybody, uh, unless you're in like severe renal failure. Um, but definitely with these diabetic patients, you wanna give them an ACE inhibitor, okay? Um, now, what actually happens when you give an ACE inhibitor is that um, it can cause dilation of the efferent arterial, okay? so. If our glomerular filtration is going to go this way, right? Blood's going this way and it has two choices. It either goes down or it goes this way, okay? If we dilate this, right, like we're doing here, uh, we're technically gonna decrease our GFR. GFR, okay? So ACE inhibitors will do this. ARBs will too. Um, because it's blocking this angiotensin too, so you're not gonna get constriction. So you can, now this is fine to a certain point, okay? So if you, for people that don't have renal failure, decreasing your GFR a little bit is not that big of a deal. So you can use an ACE inhibitor. But when a patient gets into say stage five renal failure and their, their GFR is like 10%, you need to take them off of this because that 10% is uh, all they have left, okay? But in a general sense, you can use ACE inhibitors unless there is a significant uh, um, GFR reduction uh, initially. Okay. Um, patients, right. So yeah, so like, the, and I think Dr. Clunes brought this up a lot, this bilateral renal artery stenosis. Um, if you were to give an ACE inhibitor, it will cause a drastic decrease in GFR. So you need to be aware of that. So not only those patients that have severe renal failure, but with this bilateral renal artery stenosis, um, adding, an ACE, adding an ACE inhibitor um, will decrease the GFR a lot quickly. So you, don't, you need to be aware of that. So never give an ACE inhibitor uh, if it's bilateral. All right, yeah, you can't give it in pregnancy either. You can get congenital malformations um, and uh, decreased development, yeah, in urea and renal failure, okay? All right, good. Come on, oh, that's it. All right. All right, so far, so good. ARBs, very similarly, they just don't activate bradykinin, so um, you won't get that call for the angioedema. 
and they, they end in sartan. All right, so same mechanism pretty much. Uh, don't give them in pregnancy, same principle as ACE inhibitors. And again, with that bilateral renal artery stenosis, it is the drug of choice for unilateral. So make sure they're talking about bilateral. Too much uh, decrease in GFR too quickly, not good. All right, and then renin inhibitor, you think they like this drug, but I don't know what the pharmacokinetics of it, but um, they, they don't use it that much. I, I just remember it's renin, a renin inhibitor because it ends in ren. Okay, but I doubt they'll ask you about this one. Okay, so then we get to our calcium channel blockers. Now, there are two classes. Uh, they're the non-dihydropyridines and the dihydropyridines. Um, it is important to note the differences here. Dihydropyridines basically only work on the vasculature, okay? They're gonna work to vasodilate the vasculature. The non-dihydropyridines work on the cardiac, uh, cardiac myocytes and the vasculature, okay? So, Typically, if a patient just has benign hypertension and no heart failure, you just give them one of these and you just dilate their vessels. But if a patient does have some sort of heart failure and hypertension, you give them the non-dihydropyridines. Um, I always got these confused, it was a pain. So I just remember DNA, so DNA, right? DNA, those go together and those are just for the vasculature. That's what we're talking about here. The other ones go with the other set. All right, good. So you know that they fall, they also fall in that class uh, four, one, two, class four of the antiarrhythmics or calcium too, right? So those are when you're gonna use those uh, non-dihydropyridines. All right. Um, kind of just goes into the process, but it's this sodium calcium exchanger. So you're blocking calcium from being available to the, to the um, myocytes. All right, so again, first line drug. And just take note, you would not give these dihydropyridines for, um, for cardiac arrhythmias. If you think about it, these are just working on the vessels. So if you vasodilate the, the vessels, you can get reflex tachycardia. It may precipitate some sort of arrhythmia. So just be careful with that you'd wanna give one of the non-dihydropyridines uh, because it's actually working on those cardiac myocytes too. Yeah, here you go, that reflex cardiac stimulation. A big one, I put it in red, they like to test on that, rapid though will cause constipation. Gingival hyperplasia as well. Now, the non-dihydropyridines, these are the ones that would fall in that class four that you'd wanna give for uh, certain arrhythmias. And then we're not going to talk about the diuretics again, but um, yeah, there are, so again, the glutes is what you can use for that, for these thiazide adverse effects. Loops, we talked about those, potassium sparing. Was there a specific slide that said which ones are um, prevent myocardial remodeling? Maybe not. Um, and then beta blockers, of course, um, these are basically just going to help to slow down. Uh, it's, it's more of a beta one effect. You're slowing the heart rate down because if you think beta two, well, you're preventing that vasodilation. You think of these as more of the beta one effect that they use, right? So you're thinking of like a tenolol and metoprolol. Remember A through M, uh, the ones that fall A through M are selective. So they'll choose like beta one over beta two and in through Z uh, beta one equals beta two, okay? So it's a little tricky. Why would you wanna block beta two since it's, it does vasodilation, but this is mostly think about the beta one, You're putting some relief on the heart from working so hard. Okay, and you could see this here. Right. The thing that they like to talk about with beta blockers um, is that in diabetic patients, when they have episodes of hypoglycemia, a lot of times the first uh, symptom of that is tachycardia. Okay. So if a patient's on a beta blocker, a diabetic patient is on a beta blocker, they need to be aware that they might not get that initial warning sign of tachycardia because the beta blocker 
is in, in essence slowing down the heart rate. Okay, so that's a good test question. Obviously, you're not giving a beta blocker to someone who has asthma. All right, so alpha-1 blockers, remember alpha-1 works on those vessels to vasoconstrict. If you block those, you can vasodilate, right? So that's good. Also, uh, you, they use it for BPH as well. Okay, so um, yeah, you're blocking that sympathetic response so you can the, the patient can urinate better. All right, and then mix alpha beta. Yeah, those are these are more common these days because you could get uh, you can block that alpha one, and you could also block the beta one of the heart. So you get vasodilation and you get a decreased heart rate. Clonidine is a tricky one because alpha two is more of an inhibitory; it's centrally acting, so it has this like autonomic effect of inhibiting the autonomic system. So it like uh, slows down your sympathetics. Um, so, uh, they use that sometimes the thing you have to watch out for this is if patients get off of this too quickly, they get what's called rebound hypertension. So their, their, their blood pressure skyrockets. Okay. So if you ever see rebound hypertension, they're talking about clonidine. It's classic for that. Here you go. Uh, methyl dopa, good for pregnancy. Um, that's, uh, the, the, the drug of choice there. So keep that in mind. Um, and then you have your direct vasodilators, okay? So hydralazine and minoxidil, which is Rogaine actually, causes hypertrichosis. Uh, they don't use it first line, but it works directly on the smooth muscles uh, to, in, um, to uh, dilate the, the vessels, okay? On the arterioles, direct vasodilators. All right. Watch out for that lupus-like syndrome. They'll, they'll just give you symptoms of lupus. They won't tell you it's lupus-like syndrome. So you need to know the drugs that go with that. And if there's any, any sort of um, uh, malignant hypertension that you need to address uh, immediately, minoxidil can work. But typically they talk about hydralazine. All right. Pulmonary hypertension. Remember, anytime you have pulmonary hypertension, it can lead to core pulmonale, which means right heart failure. So you don't want to, um, you don't want that to occur. Uh, so prostaglandins are always going to help to vasodilate. So that's a good way of doing it. Endothelin is a vasoconstrictor. So if you inhibit that, you could be good. Sildenafil is Viagra, but it is a vasodilator. So it can be used in pulmonary hypertension. Okay. And you can see it is important um, that you know which they go with which. So apoprostol is PGI-2. Um, I think that's really the only one you need to know. But Centen, I don't know if they'd ask you about that. And they just like this one, the class of that it works, right? So it's inhibitor of phosphodiesterase 5, um, increases CGMP, increases nitric oxide. Um, so um, so it'll, it'll improve blood flow you know, um, as Viagra or in the pulmonary system. Can't give it to a patient on nitric oxide. A lot of patients take nitro for, for angina. They take those sublingual tablets, nitroglycerin, and it'll help to vasodilate the, the, um, the, the, um, the, the coronary vessels, right? Um, but if they, so you can't give them something like this because that's too much nit nitric oxide. They'll vasodilate too much, they'll go into shock. All right, so definitely know these. These are very important, what comes with what, first lines versus second lines and stuff like that. Um, and just knowing importantly, like diabetes, definitely get them on an ACE inhibitor that's renal protective, um, stuff like that. All right, good. All right, then we get into the hypertensive crisis. So again, you like um, nitroprusside is a good one that you can use. That's typically what they use. This is the emergency situation. So you need to get prompt vasodilation. These patients coming in there, systolic pressure is over like 200. Okay. Uh, it inhibits, I think, uh, complex four of the electron transport chain. So it causes cyanide toxicity. Um, you can give sodium thiosulfate uh, to treat that. Yeah, not that that's high yield, that you'll get to that later. Um, we talked about labetalol. Uh, I'm pretty sure labetalol is 
is good for pregnancy as well. It doesn't say that here, but I'm pretty sure that's right. Vindolapam, whenever you think of a dopamine receptor agonist, think that it's good for the kidneys, okay? Um, typically, whenever, uh, the only thing I've ever seen when they use something like this is when they're worried about um, the kidneys, such as renal insufficiency, okay? Um, because that do they have dopamine receptors, I believe in the afferent arterial to help the vasodilate, so you get increased blood flow to the kidneys, so that's good to know. Um, yeah, calcium channel blocker, of course, nitroglycerin. Yeah, but typically they would give nitroprusside. All right. Um, yeah, and then these are just, you can go through these on your own. Hydralazine is good for pregnancy as well. So anytime a patient gets eclampsia or preeclampsia, you know, that that's caused, that causes hypertension, you can give them hydralazine. All right, heart failure. Now we talked about this, what the difference is systolic versus diastolic. So systolic, you should say pump failure. If you're giving drugs to help with pump failure, you're gonna give something that's gonna help the pump make work better. If you remember diastolic is um, talking about filling problems. So if you're giving something to help with the filling problem, you're giving something to help relax the heart. Now, there are some crossovers here that you wanna give just in heart failure in general, but some of the specific ones, such as, um, Lord, digoxin, right? You give it for systolic because it helps the heart pump better. Whereas for diastolic, you can give like a calcium channel blocker. It'll help relax the heart and help it feel better. Okay, so um, keep those in mind. You know, if you think about it, think through it, you really don't have to memorize it. Um, it'll just make sense. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Right. So reduced ejection fraction. Um, we're talking about an ejection problem. Okay. So um, it's dilated, it's floppy, and there's a, an ejection problem at this point. Um, so spritolactone, direct vasodilators, those can be used, um, anotropic agents such as digoxin. Whereas diuretics, the ones in yellow, you can use for either reduced or preserved, okay? So ACE inhibitors, diuretics, beta blockers, give them for all. Um, I think spironolactone may as well be for both, but direct vasodilators and inotropic agents, you wanna give for reduced because it'll help the blood flow, help the pump work better. Okay, so don't listen to me. Spironolactone apparently is only used in reduced ejection fraction, okay? That's why it's in green. Um, but if it's preserved, I guess you don't, you don't want to use that. Um, again, so preserved, we're saying that uh, it's a diastolic problem. We want to be able to relax the heart a little bit more so that we can get more blood into it, right? So again, you could use di diuretics, ACEs, beta blockers, and the one that you would want to use in preserved ejection fraction is calcium channel blockers because again, that calcium blockade will help to relax the heart a little bit more. It'll help to feel better. All right, good classes, that's fine. Um, yeah, so here's the example of prolonging survival. They help to prevent myocardial remodeling. So by definition, you're helping with survival. Of course, they are teratogenic, so be careful with that. Um, same thing with the ARBs, direct vasodilators, um, we talked about those. Here's one of those things that comes up sometimes. Um, for whatever reason, ACE inhibitors don't work as well in African-American populations. So you can switch them instead of using the ACE inhibitor, you can use a direct vasodilator. Okay, just in case they ask you that on the exam. Um, I don't know how clinically, if doctors even go through that process, but I think there were some exam questions um, uh, that talked about that. Okay, again, remember direct vasodilators work on, um, with nitric oxide, that work with nitric oxide. You gotta watch out if the patient is on sildenafil. And then again, hydralazine, that lupus-like syndrome that comes up. All right, beta blockers, reverse, uh, reverse cardiac remodeling, help with long-term survival. Okay, now that, that should, this should make sense. If, if the heart can't properly compensate, right? If it can't, if it's not, if it, if, it, if 
it can't uh, compensate for the heart failure. So say the left heart's failing and the right heart has to give, get more blood to the, the, if it can't properly do that to keep the stroke volume up, you, you don't wanna give a beta blocker because the beta blocker is gonna stop or, or decrease the blood flow. It's gonna decrease the work of the heart. It's gonna decrease contraction. So if you're decompensated, you're really, your heart's working just to keep you alive. So giving a beta blocker is not exactly a good idea. Okay. Um, and we talked about spironolactone. Yeah, with those, remember they have those um, anti-androgenic effects. Hyperkalemia, watch out for arrhythmias. Okay, now the Joxins, the big one, again, they really don't use it that much anymore, but in, when it first came out, it was like this novel drug, you know, it like makes the heart just work better. Remember, it has this inotropic agent. It's a negative chronotrope, which it means it slows down the heart rate, but it's a positive inotrope, which makes it, it squeezes better, right? It contracts harder and it works. Yeah, you see that here. Um, right, and yeah, so by doing that, working together to have more of a uh, le less heart contraction, but when it does contract, it contracts stronger, that process will help to decrease myocardial oxygen demand, okay? Um, and this is how it works. Basically, it blocks the sodium potassium ATPase. So sodium will be inside the cell. This is tricky, this, goes, this is bidirectional. Um, these little arrows. So what happens is by blocking this, there's a ton of sodium in the cell. So the sodium over here wants to rush out of the cell. So it rushes out. That means calcium comes into the cell. So there's a lot of free calcium, okay? They could ask you about this process. So just remember this goes both ways. So if you have a lot of sodium in, you kick the sodium out to bring calcium in, the more calcium you have, the stronger you can contract the heart, okay? Um, Yeah, so atrial fibrillation. So the atria is just kind of shaken, right? You need to be able to say, slow down, let's have a nice concentric heart, uh, you know, heartbeat, right? So atrial fibrillation is a good example where digoxin could be used. Um, and, but again, digoxin is for symptomatic relief. It's not gonna uh, help with cardiac remodeling or anything like that. And this is why it's really not used as much in, anymore because of this toxicity, okay? that it could have one of the ones that they talk about classically is this yellow hue in your vision. Um, so be aware of that at any time they talk about that or halos and dark objects, uh, that, that could be digoxin toxicity. Now these precipitating factors, these, this, what this means is if any of this is happening, when you give digoxin, it could lead to digoxin toxicity, okay? So if a patient has hypokalemia, um, that will um, block this pump, which means there'll be more sodium available to help to shuttle the, the calcium. So the, it, can it can cause too much calcium intracellularly. But um, just in case these come up, um, it's a little complicated, but um, just be aware of these. These can lead to, if the patient is in a setting of this um, and they take digoxin, it could cause it uh, digoxin toxicity. Okay, and then these are the interactions. So whereas, if you have hypercalcemia, it could lead to digoxin toxicity or um, hypomagnesemia, uh, they, are, they work opposite, okay? So um, just in case they ask that, I don't know if y'all have come across questions like that. That is a little bit complicated, like I said, but um, those are some of the things. But the main one to remember is a setting of, you never wanna give digoxin in the setting of hypokalemia, okay? Because that'll um, uh, make it worse. All right, then the adverse effects as well. Okay. Right, and so you never wanna give it for a diastolic dysfunction. You always give it for systole, systolic because it will help with contraction. All right. Treatment for diet, okay, we kind of talked about this. Here are some other inotropic agents. Go through these on your own. I mean, these weren't super important. CAMP, phosphodiesterase inhibitors, yeah, okay. 
I don't know that they'll ask about that. Remember when we talked about dopamine, uh, um, we're talking about help with uh, renal perfusion. Dobutamine, uh, they only give this when the patient comes in and they're, they're in complete heart failure and it'll help to um, stimulate the heart, um, stimulate contraction. Glucagon can be used, increase CAMP. So similarly to like um, uh, beta agonists as well, right? Works through a similar process. All right, now, again, like I said earlier, these antiarrhythmics are difficult, but the test questions weren't as bad as I thought. Like they only tested us basically on what I'm gonna explain to you guys here. So there are two different um, electrical impulse graphs that we're gonna look at. This is the myocardial, the one you know classically, right? So we have that upstroke of uh, sodium, then the potassium, then that calcium plateau, and then potassium, and then sodium, right? So the, um, the class one and class three are gonna work on this graph, okay? Class two and class four are gonna work on the actual nodes, the SA node specifically, okay? So when we look at these, I mean, we've talked about this in FTM and stuff, I wanna get to the drugs. So as I said, you can see the two different graphs, remember, one and three, the sodium and potassium antiarrhythmics are gonna work on this. And then two and four, the beta blockers and calcium channel blockers are gonna work on this, okay? The pacemaker graph. So it's very, very different and very important that you know uh, the differences there. Okay, um, let's get to the drugs. So again, they're kind. They briefly talk about these different arrhythmias, um, but we really get into it in term five. You really don't need to know how these work right now. Um, you just need to know the definition of how these um, these drugs work. Okay. So the class one. Remember, so it's sodium. So we're gonna we're gonna work on the myocardium. Okay. So one A B. And um, yeah, let's get to those. Okay, so the sodium. So we're working on the myocardiograph. I did not show it again. Okay, here we go. Yeah, so you wanna, you wanna slow the rate of the phase zero depolarization. And what you could do is you could see that here. So on a test question, they could ask you, they could say the patient has an arrhythmia, they want to use a drug that will not only extend QRS, but it'll also extend QT. Okay, so you would know the definition. That would be a good example of a class one antiarrhythmic. They may even give you this graph, okay? We had graphs like this. So make sure you're able to identify this graph and know which one goes with which, okay? Um, right, and there are some weird little side effects like quinidine has this uh, synchronism, blurry vision, tinnitus and headache, even psychosis. So be aware with that. Another good thing that you, you could know now, anything that increases QT, okay, can lead to torsadus to points. Now, why is that? If you extend, um, uh, let's go back to the picture. If you extend this QT right here, What you're doing, like the longer, so by extending QT here, you're making this, technically you're making this whole interval longer. I mean, you're extending it here, but what happens in this zone is, is very dangerous. You're tempting fate here because what can actually happen is you can get re-entrance. You can get uh, abnormal polarizations here. And the problem is the longer you prolong that QT, the more opportunity they have for an aberrant uh, impulse to go through. Okay, so just keep in mind, anytime you prolong that QT, you can be at risk for getting to a points, which means it starts, it starts firing uh, straight through. And uh, so that's, it's big for the class three drugs, but it can happen in these as well. Okay. Um, Procainamide is another one. Again, lupus-like syndrome. Good to know that. This is the other one, dysopyramine. Um, 
I don't know that they asked us anything about that. Just know which drugs go with which class. Okay, good. Let's see. Um, okay, so now they could ask you, we want to use a drug that prolongs QRS but shortens QT. That's classic for these uh, 1B antiarrhythmics such as lidocaine, okay? So again, you have to be a cardiologist looking at arrhythmias to decide, do we wanna shorten the QT or prolong the QT or whatever? So you don't really need to be able to differentiate types of arrhythmias with the drug. You wanna just be able to um, identify what goes with what by definition. All right, uh, but a caveat, uh, it is good to know that lidocaine can be used for ventricular arrhythmias. Okay, so just, just know that too. It comes up in term five as well, but um, just keep that in mind. Okay, so then we have our class 1C. Now look at this, what if they said, we want a, a drug that will prolong the QRS significantly, but not change the QT. Well, then you could use the 1C drugs. Okay, so again, ventricular arrhythmias, but again, this could be used for either. So, um, you know, take that as a grain of salt. This is a great uh, example of something they could ask on the exam. I would, I would put a star on this slide. So make sure you can differentiate these different graphs, which one's 1A, which one's 1B, and which one's 1C. All right, definitely high yield. Okay, phase zero and three, phase zero and four, and just phase, phase zero here, okay. All right, um, and then our beta blockers. Now, we said this class two, these beta blockers are gonna work on the node, okay? So we're looking at that nodal graph now, the SA node. So what they do by definition, they decrease the slope of this phase four those initial phase four uh, sodium funny channels, if you decrease the slope, it's gonna fire less frequently, okay? So you're gonna get a prolonged or increased um, uh, PR interval, okay? And that'll, that'll help to um, slow down those SA nodes, fire, uh, the SA node firing. All right, um, and then it just kind of goes into, you know, the side effects of these um, beta blockers. All right, now, Potassium channel blockers, class three, we're going back to the myocardial graph, okay? Now, look at this, look what they do. They prolong this QT, that is what they do. They work on this, this uh, um, repolarization phase, this phase three potassium channels. So what do you think is a big problem here? Tersodistic points, right? Or having these, uh, these new arrhythmias that form. Okay, so you have to be aware of that. Um, Amniodarone is very tricky. I'm not sure that they use it so much just because it has so many side effects, okay? So you can see here, like it could be used in the atrial arrhythmias or ventricular arrhythmias. So it's not gonna be important that you could differentiate what arrhythmia to use this with. You just wanna be able to classify it, okay? So it's, it's by definition gonna prolong this QT phase. It's gonna work on phase three, this repolarization phase by blocking the potassium channels. All right, and then here are some of the side effects here. Pulmonary fibrosis, that's a problem, right? It could cause hyper or hypothyroidism, get photosensitivity. Another thing, a big buzzword, blue skin discoloration. And then again, of course, it could cause torsadis to points. All right, sodalol falls into the same category here as that class three, and dofetilide, dofetilide too. Okay, atrial, let's use it primarily for atrial issues. All right, then class four, now we're jumping back to the nodal graph, okay? Um, so with these calcium channel blockers, similarly to the beta blockers will increase your PR interval. So we're slowing down the heart rate. Now these will work on the calcium aspect. Remember this um, phase four, and then this is phase three, um, excuse me, wait, sorry. This is phase four, this upstroke is the calcium phase, which is phase zero. So it's gonna slow the rise of this portion of the action potential. Remember the beta blockers worked on four over here, which was, um, yeah, uh, this, this um, pota uh, excuse me, this sodium funny portion, sodium funny portion, <laughs> the sodium funny channels, the beta blockers work down here on this portion, phase four. They slowed the, the slope, they slowed the slope 
they decreased the slope. Okay, that was the beta blockers. And now we're looking at this, this is called phase zero. This is the calcium phase. So if they slow this rise, these class fours, um, then it'll help to increase your PR interval. So it can help to prevent uh, tachycardia or arrhythmias. Okay, remember we're using those non-dihydropyridines because they work on the heart as well as the vessels. Okay. And then you can see the atrial supraventriculars. Again, don't forget verapamil causes constipation. And then digoxin, we talked about that positive inotrope, right? Negative pronotrope. Typically, um, okay. Yeah, so they'll use it to control ventricular rate if they did use digoxin. So a flutter or fibrillation. But again, like I said, y'all really, if y'all just know the definitions, what does what and works on what phase of those graphs, you're golden. Denosine, yeah, very short acting, um, can help to uh, fix arrhythmia short term. Um, right. So abolishing uh, acute supraventricular tachycardia. So um, you can give adenosine and it's, uh, it'll help to, to fix it in an acute setting. Uh, and I don't think they'll ask you about any of this, magnesium, adjabine, anything like that. All right, what's left? I think they just go over, okay. They kind of, and like, just know, okay, this should make sense that the ones that work on those nodal graphs are beta blockers and calcium channel blockers, right? Those were the graphs. The ones that worked on the muscle were the, um, the sodium and potassium. So two and four beta and calcium work on the nodes. Um, one and three sodium and potassium work on the myocytes, okay? Other than that, like diving into this too much, it's just not, you don't really need to. All right. Yeah. Um, so it should make sense. If you want to slow the rate down, um, you can give these uh, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers. That should make sense. And then rhythm control can be done with these. Again, this is a little bit more than you really need to get into. All right. Um, so anytime you have an angina, you, you can give nitrates, that's pretty much first line. It will help to vasodilate, help with that chest pain. Beta blockers will slow down the heart. Calcium channel blockers help to relax the heart. Renolazine, uh, it works. It almost works opposite of uh, digoxin in that it, it, it prevents cal intracellular calcium. Okay, so if you don't have intracellular calcium, the, her the heart won't work as hard. Um, it won't have as strong of contractions. All right, but you know how these work, nitrates, nitric oxide goes through the CGMP pathway, guanylyl cyclase. All right, and much of the same here. All right, so if you, if you keep in mind that, that the, in the beginning of the lectures, in the, this lecture, which ones to use with angina, you wanna slow down the work of the heart, oxygen demand and you want to vasodilate. So think about that and that'll help with the angina. First line is typically nitro. All right. All right, coagulation. Um, this is a great, I don't know that I'm even gonna go through this. I think doc, uh, uh, Dr. Dasso does a really good job explaining everything here um, uh, with these. Know just what classes go with what and um, you know, what, uh, what their, the major side effects are, right? But I think Dr. Dasso's um, test questions are very similar to his uh, IMCQ questions. So just know what goes with what. Know, um, particularly know about um, heparin and warfarin, right? Remember warfarin takes a little while to kick in a couple of weeks. So you always give heparin first. Uh, as you, uh, you transition to warfarin, know that no like heparin induced thrombocytopenia, that's a big uh, problem with heparin um, and know that the side effects of warfarin too, you know, uh, with, in regards to like vitamin K, if you have too much warfarin, 
you can give vitamin K to, um, to help to, um, to alleviate it. All right, and then the hyperlipidemics, I mean, knowing, uh, oh gosh, yeah. Like, there were like hand signs for this, right? I forget them. Um, like one is colomicron, two is LDL, something like that. <laughs> I'm sure somebody has the, um, the picture. I might've used it in one of my old, our old uh, reviews. All right, so first line statin always, unless there's a reason not to give it. But knowing um, which ones directly do what, like statins, the big thing about statins is they decrease LDL. Like some of the other ones, um, I don't remember off the top of my head, but like five rates will um, decrease triglycerides. Like that's a big thing. So knowing what their major effect is will be important. Niacin, remember that'll cause flushing. You can give aspirin prophylactically for that, but knowing stuff like hepatotoxicity and hypoglycemia as well, knowing that, um, yeah, LDL, you yeah. um, there should be a table somewhere that has everything. Honestly, I might get two or three questions on this, so. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so like, see what I have highlighted here? Statins work primarily on LDL. Fibrates are gonna work mostly on triglycerides. Um, niacin is gonna help with increasing your HDL and decreasing your triglycerides, okay? So these are kind of things that are important to know. Um, yeah, and here you go. So this would be, what would be good. Um, if, you, if in doubt, just give a statin except they're contraindicated in practice. <coughs> All right, and I'm not gonna go through this one either. I don't know why this was thrown in here. But um, yeah, these different things, right? So we've, you've come across some of these already, TM, uh, TPMT, uh, but these are just uh, modified genetic, uh, different genetics that lead to um, certain issues with medication. So. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go through all this, but um, I think that's all for that. Maybe I'll do the infection one real quick. Um, and then Lindsay can go through. Should we take a break? Uh, yes. Okay. Just a couple minute break. I'll do this and Lindsay will finish the... Um, the renal portion. All right. All right. Um, click, we'll quickly go through um, these UTIs. Remember UTIs in themselves, problematic, yes, but the, pro the real problem comes in when the, the infection regurgitates up from the bladder into the kidneys, right? Up through the ureters into the kidneys, that's when you get really bad problems. So when we talk about lower UTIs, we're talking about cystitis, but that pyelonephritis is what you really wanna watch out for. So staph aureus, big problem. Uh, typically females have a shorter urethra, so uh, they have a, uh, a higher prevalence of um, UTIs than males, but um, what you'll see is staph aureus is there. Some of those inter, enterobacteraceae um, classes, this um, staph saprophyticus and enterococcus species, uh, they can cause it as well. But think about those these when you when you do think about it, uh, these gram negative rods, uh, E. coli, Klebsiella. Proteus is big. When you think about proteus, you need to think about stone formation. So. Um, these are all going to uh, form uh, urease. And anything that forms urease is uh, going to have st make, uh, make stones. But, if, but when they give you the situation, proteus is uh, the big one. It makes those huge staghorn stones, OK? All right. So we can get into, yeah, so and it can lead these, um, these uh, lower UTIs can lead up to uh, pyelonephritis. Uh, typically they'll talk about costovertebral uh, um, tenderness, um, 
And it could even lead to things such as papillary necrosis, which is like uh, sloughing off of the um, papilla or the, uh, of the tubules. Um, and you could see that here, some other complications of papillary necrosis. So if they talk about that diabetes, urinary tract problems, sickle cell disease is another one, and uh, prolonged NSAID use as well. So a lot of times they'll give you this. The one they like is they'll say somebody recently had a back problem. They've been taking um, you know, um, some sort of NSAID ibuprofen every six hours for two months. They ended up with papillary necrosis. Okay, so be aware of that. Um, Right, and you know, right. So cystitis, frequency, urgency, burning, pyelonephritis, much worse symptoms, right? You get uh, fever, costal vertebral angle, angle tenderness as well. Okay. Um, y'all talk, y'all, well, y'all have talked about this and Lindsay's gonna go through it. Uh, post streptococcal glomerulonephritis, they always have to preface it with they had a previous strep infection, right? Typically this happens in kids. Um, they usually get better right away. Uh, and again, it shows that molecular mimicry, uh, similar to like in rheumatic fever. Okay, so you can see that here. Right. And then lower UTIs, cystitis. So lactobacillus, uh, they are common in the vaginal canal. Um, so they help to acidify the, um, the vagina to help with infections. Right, and this reflux, this vesicle ur ureter reflux is what you're worried about when that cystitis goes into, uh, into pyelonephritis. Right, but primarily when you're thinking if they don't give you any other information, E. coli is gonna be your first, your first thought for cystitis. Catheter associated, again, E. coli, Klebsiella, Klebsiella proteus. Those are common on the, on, the, on the skin flora. So they're gonna come up. Yeah, acute hemorrhagic cystitis can be caused by adenovirus. Um, yeah, not terribly important, no. Uh, the specific strain of E. coli has those uh, standard features, those virulence factors here, lipid A. All right. Proteus, remember, what, like I mentioned with Proteus, uh, you're going to get those staghorn, cell, uh, staghorn cell stones. So that's, pri uh, that's pr uh, a problem. They're actually magnesium ammonium phosphate or striuvate stones and calcium fat phosphate. Okay, so it's a big problem. You see the urease production is, is through the roof and that's what's gonna end up causing those stones. Uh, Staph saprophyticus, if you remember that this correlates to honeymoon cystitis, then you're gonna, you'll get it right. Um, it, uh, it has a, um, um, right, so they, when they talk about this, they say, you know, their people were on their honeymoon or sexually active and it just happened recently. So you could see that they're, they don't have negative nitrite because they are um, gram positive. Okay, so anything that is nitrite is gram negative. If nitrite comes up, if nitrite comes up positive, it's a gram negative. So staph saprophyticus is gram positive, so it's going to have a negative nitrite. Whereas all the other stuff, pretty much all the other stuff we were talking about, except staph aureus, is uh, gram negative. But you can see urease production, so you can get stones. All right. And this kind of breaks it down, but uh, y'all can look at this on your own. All right. Yeah, so, you know, again, right, this is what you would expect. Superpubic tenderness, cystitis, costovertebral angle tenderness, then pila. All right. Um, it's all our, yeah, okay. Well, yep, yeah, definitely check this out. Leukocyte esterase. Um, that would be uh, positive in the presence of neutrophils, all right? So that could be indicative that there's an infection there. Nitrite test is going to test to see if there's any gram negatives there, which there might be. Anything that makes urease is prone to making stones. The big one's proteus. All right. Good. Culture it. Yes. Good.
Here's a nice little picture. E. coli is urease negative, but nitrite, right? So anything that's gram negative, all three of these will have nitrite. Anything that's prone to making stones will have urease. Wait, did I say leukocyte esterase was, I, I might've said leukocyte esterase was presence of neutrophils. Um, I think that maybe that's secondary. Uh, maybe that's secondary to the infection, sorry. So these all actually are gonna have leukocyte esterase. I think that'll mean, that actually means that neutrophils would show up, but don't, don't quote me on that. I mean, it would make sense because they're a bacterial infection. Anyway, okay, so yeah, so good here. If you have this memorized, you should be good with all the, the cystitis infections, proteus staghorn stones. All right, good, 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 good. I am done. <laughs> Lindsay, you wanna uh, knock out this pathology real quick? Yeah, let's finish this up real quick. So since we're um, I already talked about this, I'm not going to go into it again, but just understand nephrotic versus nephritic. Um, so again, just pulled out the big things you need to know on here. Um, you know which are nephrotic versus nephritic because you can tell what kind of pathology it's going to be based off of the lab. So nephrotic, high proteinuria. Minimal change disease, you're looking for a kid with a history of a rep respiratory infection, or if they were recently immunized, immunized a prophylactic immunization. Um, so nephrotic, so you're going to have proteinuria greater than 3.5 grams. No hypertension, remember hypertension is more associated with nephritics. And then anasarca, which is generalized um, body edema, which makes sense because if we have a high protein area, then we don't have um, any protein, even we don't have a lot of protein in the serum. And so you're getting a lot of fluid leaking out into the interstitium. So the three big things about the glomerular diseases are light microscopy, immunofluorescence, and um, electron microscope. Those are the three things that are gonna be indicative of each individual one because sometimes they don't give you like a clear cut presentation of this is this, this is this, this is this. Um, so normal glomeruli, they will most likely tell you that there is normal glomeruli or they'll describe a kid with minimal change disease and then normal glomeruli will be a characteristic of it. No amino complement death position. And then the big, big, big thing is that there are, there's effacement or fusion of the foot processes of the podocytes. So remember nephrotic, you get damage to the podocytes, which is why you're getting all the protein um, out in the urine. And then um, something that I remember being important, this does respond well to corticosteroids versus the next one, focal segmental glomerulosclerosis, which does not respond well to corticosteroids. So this one is more associated with HIV and and obesity, um, chronic reflux nephropathy, heroin use, malignancies, light micros microscope, you're getting the segmental sclerosis and hyalinosis, kind of goes along with the name focal segmental glomerulonesclerosis, uh, glomerulosclerosis. <laughs> um, immunofluorescence that can either be negative or nonspecific granular deposits of IgM, sorry guys, and C3, complement three. Um, EM, again, like minimal change, you have diffuse effacement of the foot processes. And then these do not respond to corticosteroids. And then many of them are going to progress to chronic kidney disease and even end stage renal disease. Um, once you get to ESRD, you are put on dialysis and um, you're, it's end stage. And so your kidneys are not functioning, or your kidney or kidneys, plural, are not functioning at that point. Um, Notable, the proteinuria in um, focal segmental is insidious. So you're not going to have symptoms initially. That's going to be later. And then um, it's non-selective. The proteinuria is non-selective, so you can get all types of protein. Nephrotic range, of course. And then the degree of proteinuria is going to be your prognostic indicator. Remember, this can have a really bad prognosis. It's not going to respond to corticosteroids, and then you can develop ESRD. And so the amount of proteinuria, if, you know, if you're not catching it early, um, can be your prognostic indicator. Um, membranous nephropathy, again, nephrotic. So males, two times more likely than, um, than females, more likely in the elderly. So these are going to be more, um, this is autoimmune. So look for the PLA2R. So um, 
against those on the podocytes. And then this is what's going to lead to the immunocomplement, um, uh, immune complex deposition. So this is associated with lupus, malignancies, drugs, and infections. The biggest, biggest, biggest thing are the spike and dome appearance that you can see on um, light microscopy and um, electron microscopy. And then the deposits, you need to um, pay attention. It says granular, so versus linear, granular IgG and C3 around the um, glomerular basement membrane. That's also very important because some are gonna deposit in different places. So when you get to these glomerular diseases, a lot of the times what's going to differentiate are just these characteristics right now. Again, poor prognosis, you're going to have um, a large amount of proteinuria per day. So kind of makes sense if you're in a nephrotic syndrome and you're getting all of this protein out in the urine, it makes sense that your prognostic factor would be the amount of protein in your urine because it's kind of a measure of how much podocyte damage you have. And then renal amyloid doses, they give you two types, primary and secondary. Know what type of amyloid you're talking about and what's associated with. So AL is with multiple myeloma, AA is with um, rheumatoid arthritis. Um, big things here, you're going to see, you're going to have Congo red stain and then apple green biofrin, and then presence of apple green biofringens. Um, electron microscope with um, non branching continuous fibrils and then clinical features up at the top. This is going to be how you can um, detect it um, in your vignette. Okay, now we're moving on to nephritic. So you're still getting the protein area, but it's going to be less than 3.5 grams. But this clinical presentation is going to be associated with hematuria. So bloody urine, people are coming in, they, they're peeing blood. Um, and this is inflammation to the glomerulus and it's leading to this. So IJ nephropathy or burgers, um, uh, this is all mesangial. So no matter if you're looking at light microscopy, immunofluorescence or electron microscopy, it's all deposits in the mesangium. So you get proliferation, deposits of IgA with C3, and then of course, mesangium again, deposits there. What are you looking for in your clinical vignette? A kid coming in with episodes of peeing blood. So it's episodic. Um, so you will, you know, they will you have a peeing episode of blood, then not. Um, if they can't see the blood, most likely you are getting microscopic blood. So it's not like it's going away. You just can't see it. Um, but you have normal serum C3, C4. This is really important because when we talk about some other nephritic diseases, you don't have normal serum complement. And so highlight that that's going to be something that will clue you in on this in your clinical vignette. So kid, episodic hematuria, normal serum complement. And then this can progress to ESRD. Um, it is, there are some associations, arthritis, vasculitis, non-thermocytopenic purpura. Um, he, he, I'm not gonna try to pronounce that, HSP. And then they love to, um, it's associated with celiac disease. So that's a common one. So, you know, gluten um, intolerance there. Post streptococcal glomerulonephritis. Hopefully, this will be very easy to identify because it's going to be a kid who had a strep throat or a skin infection. Um, so now they're going to be presenting with um, edema. Then tea or cola colored urine, they might put that in the vignette. So kid strep throat now has like tea colored urine. Will be hypertensive. Remember nephritic syndromes; they commonly are hypertensive because you are um, increasing renin because of what's going on in the pathogenesis. So increase of renin, you're going to have retention and you are going to get your hypertension. So the kid will be hypertensive. Um, light microscopy, it's going to be hyper cellular glomeruli, um, immunofluorescence, granular deposits of IgG, IgM, and C3 along the glomerular basement membrane. Remember those three where they are. And then sub epithelium um, uh, humps, the uh, um, that's a big thing. And then um, to diagnose, they might either say that there are um, the titers in the vignette or they'll ask you, how can you um, diagnose it? Because at this time, you don't have um, the bacteria anymore. 
Um, membro membrano proliferative, there are two types, type one and type two. Um, they're both, they will both present with hypo hypocomplementemia because you are using up complement in their serum. So you're um, not gonna have it. So they are both, um, type one is associated with the classical pathway. It's gonna be IgG immunocomplement um, mediated, associated with hepatitis. And then you're gonna, both of them, you're gonna have the tram track appearance of splitting of the glomerular basement membrane. But um, notice between type one and type two, Type one, because it's IgG mediated, you're gonna see IgG deposits in, on immunofluorescence, whereas type two, it's not IgG mediated. So you're not gonna see IgG. So they, you'll both still have C3, C1Q and C4, but the difference is gonna be IgG in the immunofluorescence deposits. Um, so T2, um, alternate pathway, circulating C3 nephritic pack, factor, which leads to C3 activation. So if you're constantly activating C3, constantly activating the complement pathway, then you're not going to have complement in your blood. That's why you have complement, hypo complement anemia. <laughs> okay. So clinical features, what are you going to see in your vignette? So um, hematuria or proteinuria on a UA, um, acute nephritic syndrome, of course, we're talking about nephritic. So hematuria, which is a, you know, a hallmark of nephritic syndrome, hypertension, which is also a hallmark of nephritic syndrome, and then you'll have some edema, um, recurrent episodes of hema gross hematuria, all that mean, gross hematuria, all that means is you can see it versus microscopic, and then insidious onset of edema and nephrotic syndrome. So you, you don't just have maybe one or the other. Some of these can progress, and so um, this can progress to edema and nephrotic syndrome. And then rapidly progressive glomerular, um, um, this is a rapid and progressive loss of renal front function, but this is the end point of like other etiologies. It's not that this just stands alone. You have something else and then this is, you get to a point and you have rapid and progressive loss of this renal function. Um, and so progresses to death if left untreated. So histology, um, the glomerular damage is so severe. Remember you get, it's kind of like an end stage. Fibrogen, fibrinogen leaks out into the Bowman space and then you get proliferation of epithelium and that is what's forming the crescent, which is in the histocyte right there. Um, type one, type two, type three. Um, when you hear the word good pasture syndrome, I hope you immediately think of anti-GBM antibody mediated reaction. Those two terms need to go together in your head. Also linear immunofluorescence up until this point, we've only talked about granular, but good pasture syndrome is linear um, immunofluorescence. And then it's a type two hypersensitivity reaction. Um, type two immune complex mediated. So um, this is more going to be your post, your post infectious, your IgA, your HSP. So this is all glomerular, granular immunofluorescence. Um, type two essentially just know that those can develop into rapidly progressive glomerular um, nephritis. Um, and then your type three, your ANCA mediated, we've talked about those in the vasculitides. So this is coming back, coming full circle because all of those vasculitides, the small vessel vasculitides, um, had presentations in the kidneys because you're talking about, um, um, the vasculature there. So Wegner's poly microscopic polyangitis, Church Strauss, these have no immunofluorescence, um, but they are ANCA mediated. So that's very high yield, very important. Remember the different ANCAs that are associated with all the different small cell vasculitides. Um, clinical features, I put this in here really for completion's sake. Um, so um, you can look over that. Okay, lupus nephritis, the kidneys, we, you know, you've heard about lupus, autoimmune disease affecting multiple organs. The kidney is just one of those organs. So, you know, there are so many things that can present from this disease, but we're just talking about the kidneys right now. Um, so 
I pointed, I mean, a point to point out the ANA and double stranded DNA. Um, these are serum markers that you are going to be able to look for to say, yes, this is lupus nephritis. You know, a person that comes in with kidney stuff, you don't know why they're having kidney stuff. This confirms that it's due to lupus. So other things, just look for symptoms of lupus. So fever, leukopenia, thrombocytopenia, all of these things, um, SZ is seizure. <laughs> Um, but just look for a presentation of lupus. And then when we're talking about renal presentation, if you come in and you're presenting with um, renal issues, this can confirm that this is lupus nephritis. And then on immunofluorescence, everything is there. So it's positive for absolutely everything. Um, the classes here is basically just staging of what you can see. So, I mean, you can, um, minimal mesangial, mesangial proliferative focal nephritis. So it really just kind of builds and it's the extent and severity that lupus is affecting the kidneys. Um, I don't know if you guys watch the voice. I love watching the voice. One of the contestants was talking about how her sister had lupus and she had kidney failure and her mom um, get, donated a kidney, but it was ultimately unsuccessful. So if any of you watch the voice, there's your little um, real world uh, tie in right there. Um, okay, acute tubular injury and in, um, necrosis. So of course now, we're past the glomeruli, we're into the actual nephron where we're doing the exchange. And so if you get tubular injury and necrosis there, you're talking like major kidney injury. So most common cause of acute kidney injury. Um, it can be ischemic. So if you have a sudden decrease in renal blood flow, um, so you're thinking hemorrhagic shock, heart failure, anything that's going to lead to lack of perfusion at the level of the nephron, you're going to have death of the tubular cells and they can fluff off into the urine. And that actually produces muddy brown casts because you're getting the tissue. So you're peeing out the tissue. So you see muddy brown casts. That's actually a um, hallmark of um, tubular injury. Um, but really you're just you drop the perfusion there and that's why you get sudden injury and death of the tubular cells. And then of course you, um, your GFR drops off significantly, your tubular cells aren't working. So you're getting oligaria, which again is decreasing your output. So um, if you have acute tubular injury, you're, you're getting a dramatic drop in your output. You can also have nephrotoxic, um, where it's due to toxic substances. So I just put the examples right here. So ischemic type, um, it's very patchy. So short lengths of tubules affected, um, segments of the P PST and then loop of Henley and then toxic. It's very extensive, be, um, which makes sense because you are getting the injury kind of as, as it's being filtered through, you're getting the injuries throughout the entire length of the nephron. So it makes sense that you would have extensive necrosis across the entire length. Um, so uh, the staging ar around, so initial, you're all gonna have a slight decrease in urine output with a rise in blood, urea, nitrogen, creatine. Um, so blood, urea, and nitrogen, of course, nitrogen is just a breakdown product of protein in your blood, you know, back in DM, the whole urea cycle, you have to get rid of urea because it's toxic. And then creatine is um, muscle breakdown. So these are normal metabolic processes. These are normal catabolic processes that are filtered by the kidney. But as soon as you affect the kidney, these are going to go up. Um, now, just a note that you'll talk about this in term five, um, a, an isolated rise of BUN can just be dehydration. But if you, if you get a rise in creatine, then you know it's at the level of the kidney, you have kidney issues. So slight decrease in urine output, rise in BUN creatine, that makes sense because those, if you don't, aren't getting urine output, you aren't excreting those toxic, um, metabolic buildup. And then because you have transient decrease in blood flow, um, you're going to have a declining um, GFR. Um, so how are we maintaining this person? We just need to um, so, um, mean and sustain decrease in urine output. They will have salt and water overload, which makes sense if you're not peeing everything out, if you're not um, getting 
good reabsorption and filtration in the um, nephron, you're going to have salt and water overload, rising BU, and of course, because you're not filtering it out, hyperkalemia, all of those bad things. Um, yeah, that just keeps going. So diagnosis, they're going to be hypotensive, low urine output, we talked about that. They're going to be uremic. Serology, of course, we talked about elevated serum creatinine and BUN can get metabolic acidosis. Why? Because the kidneys will excrete hydrogen ions. And so if you're not getting the hydrogen ions out, they're staying in your body. So you have a metabolic, metabolic acidosis. You're also not getting out the potassium phos um, phosphate, and then you can have anemia because of decreased growth of creatin. Again, I told you that many brown casts are the hallmark of tubular injury. So that's why you're getting that because, you know, you have tubular injury, the cells are sloughing off into the lumen, and then you're getting it out. Okay, so tubular interstitial nephritis. So this is just inflammation of the... Um, uh, the tubular cells. It's not the ischemia. It's not the it's not the um, death of the cells. This is just inflammation. So this is a group of diseases involving inflammation tubules in um, and through this interstitium. Wow. Um, you'll see azotemia. So this is just buildup of the urea products, as seen as an increased BUN, blood urea nitrogen, because they're not working from drugs or pilo. I spelled that wrong. Okay, so. Uh, okay, drug induced um, nephritis, you're going to see fever, eosinophilia, that's big, big, big here. And of course, if you're seeing eosinophilia, you probably have IgG mediated. Um, so, hematuria, mild proteinuria, leukocyteria, and then of course, rising serum creatinine, which is indicative of acute kidney injury, uh, of renal cause, or acute kidney injury with oliguria, so decreased. Um, you're an output. Okay, so I actually put in a slide from our term five um, lecture because I liked how it organized this better than your slide. So I pulled one, uh, I pulled the societis stuff from your last lecture into this lecture because I liked how it explained it. So um, Brady already talked about UTIs, pile and everything. So we're gonna go through it one more time. So you can have colonization, bacterial colonization of the periurethral area. You know, it's not a clean area. You know, um, risk factors are um, sex and um, catheters, urinary catheters are one. Um, females are more prone because of a shorter urethra. So you just get colonization and then you can, can get ascension up to the bladder. The, that's where you get to cystitis because um, you're, you're getting that UTI at that point. If, you're, it's a, if it's left untreated, if it's complicated, it can still ascend up to the kidneys and that's when you get pilo and acute pilo versus chronic pilo. We'll talk about that, but um, um, if you keep going up this ladder, you can get to tubulo interstitial nephritis, and then you can get to AKI, 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 acute kidney injury. So I liked how it organized it. It's kind of like a pathway to acute kidney injury versus just kind of putting things, um, in there. So I just put that slide there and I, um, reorganized it. Huh. So um, acute cystitis, this is just a UTI essentially. Um, so super pubic plane, dysuria, frequency, urgency. Um, we talked about the risk factors. We talked about the causes when Brady went over the, um, the micro and then labs, uh, UTI, I'm, I'm pretty sure all of them are going to have positive leukocyte esterase. And then nitrites, you're going to have um, the gram negative organisms. They use E. coli a lot. They use E. coli a lot um, with that. Um, and then I already talked about how you can get further ascension and get acute pilo. So superative inflammation of the kidneys. This is this, this is an infection. So the inflammation is superative. Um, um, so you can get superative inflammation, superative necrosis of the area. You will get neutrophil ag aggregates. So this is a person coming in onset a severe costovertebral angle tenderness. Um, they'll come in and you can barely even tap on their back. It's like they're in immense pain. And then fever, nausea, vomiting, and fatigue, those are all systemic signs of inflammation of infection. So you're gonna have that as well. And then they might have had a history of UTI. Um, but on the slide, I forgot to point out, you can get hematogenous spread from other places. So if you have like an infective endocarditis, 
um, and you get an, um, an embolization, you, it can seed in this area and you can get an acute pilo. So we already talked about this. This is very, very, very important. You can get a papillary necrosis. Remember, this is, this is a superative necrosis. So you can get a papillary necrosis where you have necrotic renal papillae. So this is seen as gross hematuria. Um, um, risk factor for this complication is diabetes. And then other ones, you can have pyonephrosis, which is just buildup. And so since this is an infection, you're going to get an infected buildup, superlative exudate. You can also get a perinephric abscess if the infection breaks through and goes into the, um, breaks through the renal capsule and goes to the perinephric tissue. And you can also get chronic pilo. Um, oh, I put this in here because I had a couple questions about this because it was put in here that I don't know what this means. Um, so if you're trying to diagnose papillary necrosis, this would be a differential diagnosis. It's not saying it's under the umbrella of papillary necrosis. It's saying that this is something that you could consider if a patient comes in and they have symptoms suggestive of papillary necrosis. So just understand that analgesic nephropathy is a thing. Know what it's associated with and you're good. Um, but chronic pilo, now you're involving the renal calyces and the renal pelvis. And so um, this is getting more serious. This is recurrent or persistent infections. So you're having chronic obstructive pilo, recurrent infections, superimposed infections. Um, but yeah, but features your gradual onset of renal sufficiency, um, loss of tubular function, um, you can develop hypertension, and then you can develop the focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. Um, and then obstructive uropathy, hydronephrosis, essentially anything that can cause an obstruction um, can lead to this hydronephrosis as fluid build up in um, the ureter. Um, so any, so which can then lead to renal atrophy, progressive atrophy, because you're getting dilation. So past the obstruction, you're getting the dilation because it's filled with fluid. And so they're getting progressive atrophy because at that point you then have like a non-functional kidney. kidney. Um, so it can be unilateral, complete or partial. It can also have bilateral. Um, if you catch it, renal function can be um, relieved. And then renal stones. Um, so this is also a very classic presentation, severe flight pain rating to the groin. Why is it radiating to the groin? Well, because the nerve fibers um, are kind of along the same path. Um, nausea, vomiting. Nausea, vomiting is because of the pain, because the pain can be so bad. Like they say that kidney stones are worse than a woman giving birth. The pain is worse. And so nausea and vomiting simply because of the pain. Um, and then you can have gross hematuria. That's just simple irritation of the area. If you have a large enough stone, you can actually just disrupt the um, tissue and get gross hematuria. Um, and because you have an obstruction, you have like this foreign thing sitting there, you can get an obstruction. You can get a superimposed UP UTI due to the stasis of the urine. You can get hydronephrosis. Remember, if you have an obstruction, um, past that obstruction, you're going to get dilation of the area. Um, and then it can be associated with gout, cystinuria, and hyperoxaluria. Um, um, why? Because this um, has your increasing concentrations of certain things. And so do be, um, do know the different types of stones and um, what can precipitate them because you might ask it. Okay, so remember how we talked about hypertension back in the cardio stuff? It's essentially the same thing here, benign versus malignant hypertension. Um, so you can get nephrosclerosis. So essentially this is just the effects of hypertension at the level of um, the nephron. Um, so hardening of the renal arteries and small arteries. So benign, you're gonna have the hyaline deposition. So um, vascular, you're gonna have the medial intimal thickening, hyaline, thickening hyaline art, um, artery, arteriosclerosis. Um, you can have global sclerosis at the glomeruli, glomeruli and then focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. Um, of course, this is compensatory. And then at the um, tubular level, you can have atrophy and then ischemia. And then 
Um, malignant, remember this is a rapid rise in blood pressure, what makes it malignant and organ damage. Um, fibrinoid necrosis of the afferent arterial, you're gonna get that onion skin lesion. Remember, histo is your friend here. And then I put this, um, the other symptoms in that can clue you in on, oh, this is malignant hypertension. This is what we're seeing right now. And then renal artery um, stenosis. Um, if you have unilateral uh, renal artery stenosis, this can account for a small number of hypertension cases due to the increase in the RAS system um, because you have an ischemic kidney. Um, so then you get hypertension. And then so renal artery stenosis is due, it, most common cause is atherosclerosis. Again, um, that causes a lot of bad stuff. And then another cause you um, want to make mention of is fibromuscular dysplasia. Um, and then I just included this, arteries in the ischemic kidney are usually protected from the high pressure um, because you know, you're going to shift it at that point. So now you're kind of protected from the sharing stress versus the contralateral kidney that doesn't have the sclerosis. You're getting more of the um, stress because you're taking more of the um, insult. Um, thrombotic microangiopathies, um, they just briefly go through this, but um, again, just lesions in different systems. This is, uh, and it can have renal failure as one of its characteristics. So again, these are systemic things that just have a renal presentation. One that they love to focus on, and I'm pretty, like, I don't remember which module it is, but one module, they go into every single type of E. coli into great, great, great detail. Um, so this is just like a morsel of what you're going to get in the future, but, um, sugar toxin mediated hemolytic uremic syndrome, um, look for a kid that just recovered from about a bloody diarrhea. Why did the kid have bloody diarrhea? This E. coli is, um, 0157H7. Um, that is what is going to cause the bloody diarrhea. Then they can get, this hemolytic uremic syndrome. Um, so, um, so a kid comes in, had bloody diarrhea, now has renal symptoms, what was the causative agent, something like that. Um, you will see sch um, schistocytes on the purple blood smear, a purpuric rash. Um, the kid can have a headache, confusion, seizure, stroke, fever. And then another one that they throw in there, thrombo thrombotic thrombocytopenia purpura, associated with lupus, HIV, hematol hem hematologic uh, malignancy. Okay, then cystic diseases, they have a few slides on this. I put in what I remember being like the big stuff. So um, ADPKD, so this is a, um, autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. This is in adults. Um, so this is associated with the polycystin proteins. Um, it's on a symbol dominant, which means all generations are going to have it, unfortunately, and it's going to manifest in adulthood, not in the kids. Um, there are two types, um, PKD1, if, it, if you have the PK, if it's with the PKD1 gene, um, it's going to be more severe, it's going to present earlier, and then it's going to progress to end stage renal disease. Um, something you can also have if you have, um, if you, if it's the PKD1 gene or pancreatic and liver cysts. And then PKD2 gene, this is a slower progression, it's more mild, and it's going to present later in life. So what are you going to see? This person is going to come in with hematuria, um, and we'll have hypertension, flank and back pain. Um, some, I think when one of the videos I watched, they're like, commonly it's um, someone gets hit in the back and one of the cysts ruptures and you have gross hematuria. So they're going to come in, they got hit and now they're peeing blood and then they can find this. Um, some things that are also associated, you can have a mitral valve prolapse, you can have a very a berry aneurysm, and then you can also have chronic diverticuli. And then in the kids, it's autosomal recessive for the fibrocystin proteins. And then it's the PKHD1 gene. Alport syndrome, um, can't see, can't pee, can't hear a bee, um, straight, from, straight from first aid. But they're gonna come in with um, 
it's a mutation in the type four collagen. So you're getting irregular thinning, thickening, splitting of glomerular basement membrane, which causes a basket weave appearance on electro uh, electron microscope. And then the gene is the col 4 a 4 um, so the patient's going to come in with hematuria. They're going to have sensor, sensor, sensorineural deafness. Um, yeah, so look for those two things. So renal, eye, ear. That's outport syndrome. And then um, I, I'm going to quickly go through these. There are a couple things that they like to associate with um, the renal tumors, and I'm just going to tell you what those are. Um, so this is just the introduction. So an angiomyolipoma, that's benign. It's like a fat tumor. Um, renal cell carcinoma, this is malignant. The biggest, biggest, biggest risk factor is smoking, um, also obesity, hypertension. Um, highlight polygonal clear cells. If they talk about polygonal clear cells, you can um, assume that you are talking about renal cell carcinoma. Um, also highlight star, it can invade the IVC. So you get hematogenous spread to the lungs and bone. That's very big. So it can invade the renal vein. And if it grows within the renal vein, it can extend up to the IVC. And this is how you're getting the hematogenous spread of this cancer. I like that. Um, so what is the patient going to have? hematuria, you can have palpable mass, flank pain, fever, weight loss, you know, all of those are pretty non-specific. Um, hematuria, you know, is kind of kidney. And so um, palpable masses might be able to clue you in, but the clinical present, the symptoms aren't necessarily what's going to clue you in. What's going to more clue you in on um, is the histo, you know, the polygonal clear cells if they put this slide on there. Um, another thing that I don't know if they've introduced it to you before this point, perineoplastic syndromes. So oftentimes it's hard to diagnose something because the actual cause is mimicking something else. So for example, this is so big in respiratory. So when you get to the lung cancers, oh my goodness, there are so many perineoplastic syndromes. Like it's crazy. But essentially you're presenting as one thing and it's kind of masking what it actually is. So even though it's something wrong with your kidney, it's acting like it's a different thing. So abnormal hormone production. So um, um, it uses Cushing syndrome as an example. So all of these different things, they have nothing really to do with this, the renal cell carcinoma, but the perineoplastic syndrome, it's kind of acting like it's something else. So you could be worked up for something that has nothing to do with what it's the actual causes. So that's perineoplastic syndrome. Um, I'm pretty sure this is the, one of the first times they introduce it to you, but it becomes really big later. Wilms tumor, this is in kids, um, WT1 gene on chromosome 11P, large, well-circumscribed mass, um, anaplasia correlates with presence of TP53 and then prognostic factors, anaplasia. Um, I'm pretty sure you guys talked a lot about that in um, FDCM. Anaplasia is pretty much loss of differentiation and um, which is very bad when you're talking about cancers. Um, so make that association. And then congenital anomalies. I put this on here because I, I don't remember this being a huge thing. I remember references of um, vesicouretic reflex in other places, but not on its own. And then bladder tumors. The biggest, biggest, biggest thing are the risk of smoking and then this um, cysto cystomiasis or whatever. So cystosoma, hema, I don't know how to say that, but those are the two biggest risk factors for bladder cancer. Um, associate with squamous cell carcinoma, but that is it, guys. <laughs> All right. Uh, so we're done. Um, good luck if y'all have any issues. Y'all could just message us. Y'all thank Lindsay for this when she put all the work in and did the slides. She convinced me to do this. So, um, like I said, our exam is Tuesday. But um, if y'all need anything between now and then, we'll do our best to get back to y'all. Yeah. So, uh, good luck. We'll be sending you well wishes. That's how we're helping at this point. Sure. <laughs> All right. Bye, guys.